Infamous is a series that expanded my love for video games, and from that very first moment I downloaded that one mission long demo on the PS3, I was hooked. I mean, how could I not be? That taste of power I felt when wielding something as unruly as lightning was intoxicating, and I must have played that demo over a hundred times before... Users of Sony's PlayStation Network have been greeted instead by error messages. Now what's being called one of the largest digital data breaches in history. That Sony suffered an external intrusion, which forced their online network to shut down. So yeah, Sony says the personal information of about 75 million players may have been stolen. The PlayStation Network hack of 2011 was the lowest point in PlayStation's history. It was an external intrusion in which the personal data of 77 million PlayStation Network users were compromised. This intrusion lasted for about two days before eventually PlayStation just completely shut off PlayStation Network as a whole. This was meant to just be a short-lived solution and PlayStation put out a statement saying that they were going to get PlayStation Network back up and running within a week. But Cut to about a month later, and North American servers are finally coming back online. As an apology, PlayStation gave every single user the opportunity to pick out two free games in a catalog of about five, depending on where you lived. In North America, those games were Wipeout HD, Dead Nation, Little Big Planet, Super Stardust HD, and Infamous. Can you guess which one I picked? That's right. Wipeout HD. Obviously, I picked Infamous, and if I think back to that time, I don't really ever remember caring about PlayStation Network being offline because I didn't really have many online games. But I do vividly remember me and my twin brother freaking the hell out because we finally got the game we both really wanted for free. And as a kid, that was the best feeling ever. And once downloaded, I got to finally experience in full one of the greatest games I have ever played even if that first experience was with inverted controls because I didn't know how to change it. I then proceeded to play the entirety of Infamous easily over a dozen times to achieve absolutely everything the game had to offer. However, this was not how I played Infamous 2 because I never actually owned Infamous 2 myself. I had to experience the sequel to my favorite single player game by borrowing it from others or renting it through services like Gamefly. This allowed me to enjoy and beat the game, but not play it to the extent that I played the first game. Jump a few years later, and the new PlayStation 4 is being released, along with the new Infamous game, titled Infamous Second Son. Because I was a bit older, I could finally earn some money, so me and my previously mentioned twin brother both over the summer earned $400 to buy a Infamous Second Son PlayStation 4 bundle. Then, just like Infamous 1, I played the absolute hell out of it and beat it easily over half a dozen times before we could finally buy some other games. Now, it is mid-2022 and a full 8 years have passed since we got the last Infamous game, and around 13 years have passed since the release of the very first Infamous. In this 13 year span, I have gone from childhood to adulthood, and I found a recent love for storytelling and writing, allowing me to do something I've always wanted to do for a very long time make my own infamous game. This concept for a game will include mainly just story elements, but also some ideas for gameplay and environmental aspects. And just to be clear, I am not an expert writer, nor am I a game developer, so keep in mind I am simply going at this with wild creativity and a soft idea at what developers limits are. Also, before I begin, if you have not played the games or completely forgot the story, then go ahead and watch this video that I made about the full infamous story because I will be making many gameplay and story connections to those games, so keep that in mind for if you need to go watch that or not. Also, I would like to ask if you would consider either subscribing, engaging with the video in any way, or just watching it all the way through, as that would help me out a ton. But with all that out of the way, let's finally get into my concept for the next Infamous game, titled Infamous Prodigal Son. When first starting out the game, you will be shown a short cinematic of a boat floating out to sea. In fact, this is the exact same boat that is at the end of Infamous 2 that some of you might immediately recognize. You might wonder what's happening or what you're supposed to do, but as the boat gets further and further away, at some point, the game directs you to hold down on your d-pad. This action is immediately met with chaotic controller haptics, and a bolt of lightning strikes the boat just as it did at the end of Infamous 2. But this time, you might notice that it's a little bit different. 
as right when the lightning bolt strikes, the boat disappears. You'll then see a body floating in the water, and as the camera pans to the dark night sky, the title Infamous Prodigal Son appears on the screen. There's a slow fade down as the body washes up on shore. You never get to directly see the body's face, but you know who it must be. Just as this is happening, you might notice the slight sound of a bell slowly growing in volume. As the sound nears, it stops, only to be followed by more sounds of a boat docking. The camera pans to reveal where the sounds were originating from and an unkempt fisherman exits the boat ramp onto a wooden dock. As the fisherman starts to slowly make his way towards the body, he starts shouting questions, asking if the body's alright, and telling it to not joke around. But once he finally reaches it, he flips it over to show Cole's lifeless face. Just to be clear, the fisherman doesn't know who Cole is currently, but he does find him oddly familiar as we will talk about later, and for now, he just wants to help someone out who he thinks might be close to dying. Also, I'm gonna get it out of the way now, but I do understand that there's going to be a lot of people who won't like Cole's return. In my opinion, reviving him does slightly cheapen his death at the end of Infamous 2, but at the same time, you gotta understand what these games are based off of. From its inception, Infamous is a superhero game. The developers at Sucker Punch were heavily influenced by comics such as DMZ and Batman No Man's Land. Like every comic, the hero never stays dead for long, and to be honest, if they didn't want me exploring this option at all, then they shouldn't have hit him with lightning at the end of Infamous 2. But seriously, as you keep listening, you will learn that I do have an explanation for his revival, and in my opinion, it is far from just some cheap fan service, and I made it work within the confines of this reality's rules. Now, let's get back to the story before I go on more tangents. I'm doing it now. I'm going off script. When will this end? Will we ever get back to the story? Is it going to be two hours of just me doing this? I think it. As soon as the fisherman could, he checked Cole's pulse to find no rhythm whatsoever, and immediately he began CPR, all the while saying stuff like, please don't be dead. After a minute or so, he realized that this probably wasn't going to work, and immediately he began to roll Cole's body onto a net before dragging him onto a boat where he's then taken to his main quarters. The fisherman goes to a specific cabinet and starts to look through a bunch of medicine before pulling out a small package. He opens it up, and it's a defibrillator which he attaches to Cole. The fisherman starts off small, giving Cole a small shock. This produces a one second flashback of memories on screen. He turns up the dial as the first one didn't work, and he tries again, this time giving Cole about a 3 second flashback of memories on screen. The final time is at absolute full power, and you get a very quick flashing montage of all the events that have happened in the past games that Cole was involved in. Cole's eyes immediately bolt open as he coughs up a ton of water before putting a hand on his head. Where the hell am I? He grumbles as he looks around the boat. Cole then sees the fisherman and looks down at the defibrillator that's hooked up to his chest. He looks back up at the man and thanks him for saving his life before asking about his situation, such as how he got here and what the man's name is. The latter is answered first as he responds with the name Jedediah Rose, but his friends call him Jed. This name immediately hits Cole and he instantly starts getting flashes of Zeke, remembering the events which he had forgotten. Jed sees the distress that this causes Cole and asks him if everything is alright. Cole ignores him and again asks how he was found here and Jed simply says that he saw him floating to the bank and a minute later decided to dock his boat to try to help. He then asks for Colt's name and when he hears it, he asks, Are you like a movie star or something? Cause you seem real familiar. Cole, still slightly in shock, disregards this question and asks where they're at. Jed says that they're New Marais or at least they're about a 5 minute boat ride from it. Cole looks relieved but suddenly winces and puts a hand on his head. Cole immediately whispers to himself that he needs to find Zeke before asking Jed out loud how he would get to the main city from here. Jed says that he can give him a ride, and the player finally takes control of Cole. This short boat ride to the city offers both exposition and some tutorial options, but there is a noticeable lack of powers at this point. This is deliberate as Cole has no electricity stored inside of him, and this is how he survived floating in the water and didn't die from it for so long. Once they arrive closer to the city though, Cole passes a transformer and suddenly he feels better. He's then able to drain it just purely by muscle memory, and now he has his powers. Jed watches as this is happening and immediately shouts, Holy shit balls! How did I not notice? You're, you're Cole McGrath. You died. How are you even alive? 
and memories instantly start to flood Cole when he hears the word died. He remembers almost everything about his death and his fight with the beast. Jed states that he's confused and asks Cole why he was gone for so long. Cole asks Jed what he means by this, and just then, the city comes into view. But unlike the past, New Marais looks much different. Now, the city is overrun by an overwhelming amount of neon lights. Cole can't believe his eyes and asks Jed just one question. What do you mean by gone for so long? Jed disappointedly says, Cole, you've been dead for 13 years. This is where we get our first stylized graffiti cutscene that explains the major antagonist of the game as well as some backstory that happened during this 13 year gap. For seven whole years after Cole's death, the United States had been overrun by an agency called the DUP. In an attempt to enslave conduits, the DUP rounded most of them up and put them in a single prison called Curtin K Station. Again, this went on for seven whole years until one day an egotistical, tyrannical, and infamous conduit named Delson Rowe destroyed the DUP and in doing so stole hundreds of powers from the conduits of Curtin K. Afterwards, Delson went down a twisted path that ended with the nuking of Seattle that was caused by the government trying to stop Delson. This didn't work, however, and only proved that Delson was unstoppable. Eventually, the government had to bow down to Delson because he was just too powerful, and now, to this day, Delson is still in charge. When he first took power, Delson wasn't interested in ruling at all, and the country fell into a type of anarchy. But slowly, Delson grew more and more power hungry. Eventually, he even founded a personal military that consisted of old DUP agents and allowed the few friends he had to take over and rule the cities of their choice. So that's it. That's the state of the world right now. Cole put down his life to save the planet, and they decided to lock up all remaining conduits, and then yet another tyrant rose to conquer the powers that be. But Cole being the hero he is wasn't going to stand for it. Right then and there, he knew what he had to do. He was going to find Delson and put a stop to his tyrannical reign. This is where the cutscene ends, and Cole then asks some questions that are on everyone's minds. First, how did he get here? And second, what happened to New Murray? Jed can only answer one of those questions, but first, they gotta dock their boat. The only problem with this is Jed knows that there are armed thugs actively patrolling the waters in front of them, so Cole must take them down so Jed's boat can get near the dock. It takes a few minutes, but eventually Cole takes down a bunch of enemies using his most basic powers such as the regular lightning bolt, grenades, shockwaves, and missiles. Personally, I felt it was important not to have this infamous game be a complete reset of powers as I have a lot of ideas for future abilities and giving the player all of the basics at the start will allow me to stack more things on top of that later in the game. Also, the way it works is when in certain situations, Cole will remember some of his abilities and the player can then immediately use them as the game instructs. For example, when Cole and the player learn to use his grenade, there's a group of enemies in front of him and suddenly he remembers the muscle memory of what to do in that moment therefore giving the player a tutorial of what to do and in what situations to use certain things in. After defeating all the enemies, both Cole and Jed move on to the main dock into the main part of the city, and Cole immediately wants to contact Zeke. He asks Jed for a phone, and Jed hands him one, but it's been 13 years, and Zeke's number doesn't work anymore. At this point, Cole doesn't at all know where to go from here. He doesn't even know if anyone will trust or help him, but Jed says that the people of New Marais will trust him. Cole is unsure, but Jed says he can prove it. Jed begins to lead Cole throughout the city, and all the while he explains the whole situation with New Marais. Basically, the whole city is now controlled by a conduit named Fetch Walker. Delson's prior right-hand woman. Since Fetch took control of the city, it has been a seemingly lawless place. Her relapse into drugs has been a slippery slope of chaos, and lately, she hasn't even tried to hide it from the public. Jed tells Cole that he believes that she is broken and her lack of hiding her addiction is secretly a silent cry for help, and also says that his brother, God rest his soul, did the same thing before his death. Jed also explains that the thugs that oppressed the city used to actually be led by Fetch, but now they hold little to no respect for her, and at this point, they are basically just free to terrorize the drug-ridden mess that is New Marais. When they finally arrived at their destination, a rooftop overlooking St. Ignatius Cathedral, 
Cole saw something that filled him with hope. Cole saw his amp atop a pillar that commemorated his great sacrifice nearly 13 years ago. Jed looks over and sees the shocked yet determined look on Cole's face and explains that the whole world knows and remembers his sacrifice and with all that's happening right now, they could really use a savior like him. Cole somberly looks down at his amp and then around at the city, finally turning to the horizon beyond. When he died, he thought that that was going to be his final sacrifice and he would finally find some peace, but now he knows that that will never happen. Cole is destined to fight for the world when nobody else will and live up to that title of savior the best he can. Cole turns to thank Jed for helping him out and tells him that if there's anything he will need, just find a way to contact him and he will totally help out. Jed thanks Cole and tells him that he might just take him up on that sometime and that's basically just a hint that he's going to have some side mission stuff but that he's no longer needed for the main story anymore. With their paths now split, Cole drops down from the roof and slowly makes his way towards the pillar. Eventually he climbs it and as he stands above it, lightning wildly sparks around him and he sends a message to the whole world by pulling his amp out of the stone. But unlike the tale of King Arthur and Excalibur, this would not go down as a legend. Hundreds of people saw this and they all recorded it on their phones, instantly making the moment a worldwide event. Every man, woman, and child would learn of the return of Cole and Delson is no exception. Sitting on his graffiti covered concrete throne, he watched as the world suddenly gained something they hadn't had for years, hope. On one hand, Delson was absolutely furious. He worked so hard to break down the world this much, and now he would have to do it all over again. But on the other hand, Delson was confident that he would soon make an example out of Cole and gain a new power in the process. Delson immediately contacted Fetch and told her that the whole city of New Marais must go into lockdown. Knowing he can't fully trust Fetch to follow through because of her mental state, he also assigned Celia to capture Cole. I don't expect most of you to know who Celia is, but she is a very minor character within Infamous Second Son, and she is the main kind of antagonist of Infamous Paper Trail, but I know not a lot of people played that, but just know she has paper powers, and she kind of looked up to Delson, but you'll see in this game that that's not exactly how it is, and you can kind of treat her as a new character. As Celia symbolically stands on the right hand side of Delson's concrete throne, she sends her very loyal origami ninja army to look after the city of New Marais and to scout out and keep an eye on Fetch as she cracks a sinister smile knowing exactly what she's about to do. Zeke woke up in his bed like it was any other day. He kissed his pregnant wife on the forehead before moving to check on his twin daughters. He had only been married for about 4 years, but honestly these were the best years of his life and his kids were the best things that had ever happened to him. As he made his way to the living room and turned on the TV, the sun was just coming up because he lived on the west coast of the United States and he wanted to see what the crazy tyrant Delson was up to. As soon as Zeke switched the channel to the news, he saw the regular broadcasts. The hosts were talking about famine, death, and surely they would soon get to talk about the other two horsemen. But of course, none of this was new to anyone in the world and especially not Zeke. As he started to make his way towards the kitchen, he began his daily ritual of reminiscing about the world before the blast and thinking about Cole before suddenly the news feed switched. As he heard the breaking news, Zeke immediately bolted towards the TV and stared in stunned silence as he saw the long awaited yet impossible return of his best friend. After the act of holding the amp high above his head in a victorious pose, Cole brought the amp down to inspect it. He noticed that it was in pristine condition, and as he was wondering how it went so long without being touched, hundreds of people began to rush towards him. Most, if not all of them, were taking pictures, shouting questions, and cheering out of pure excitement. After all, this was his city, and nobody knew how he was back, but at that moment, nobody cared. All they knew is that the prodigal son had returned. <laughs> Alright, now I think it's time that I address the elephant in the room. You may have noticed that unlike the other infamous games, I have left basically zero room for Cole to be the bad guy, and to be honest, that was a deliberate choice. For a multitude of reasons, I felt it best to not have a karma system in this game, and please, before you freak out and rush to the comments, 
hear me out, and hear my plan to appease the players that do love being the bad guy. Okay, so first off, why did I remove Karma from an infamous game? Really, there is one main reason. I want this game to be a shift for the series, very similar to that of Uncharted 4. Both those and this game are very story focused and, so far, the last main games in their respective series. And for this reason, I didn't want to water down the story by having two very separate paths that would only make the development for this game more difficult and therefore make each path more shallow. This problem is very clearly seen with all the other Infamous games, but mostly with Infamous Second Son. When I replayed that game, I noticed that most of the dialogue had to be shared between the two paths. This forced Delson's character to be what I would call a lovable asshole, as he couldn't be too much of a good guy or the bad playthrough would look very weird, and he can't be too much of a dick or the players who chose to be a good guy would be very put off. But I do understand why this decision was made on the part of Sucker Punch and I'm not really blaming them. If it was any different, they would basically have to make two completely different games with two completely different scripts, and each of them would have to react to the player's input, and overall, they would basically be making two different games for the price of one. But by streamlining and focusing on the good playthrough in this game and making it more fleshed out, we can save some time on development, and things within the story can make much more sense. For instance, why would Cole even decide to be the bad guy? He risked his life to save the world, and even if he came back with a grudge against humanity, I can't really see a way to shove him on the dark side without it seeming very contrived. And on the business side, the game wouldn't lose many sales either. A huge, huge majority of players exclusively play the hero in these games, and once they've beaten it, they just move on. And finally, if you're wondering, here's my solution for the players who want to be the bad guy. About 6 to 12 months after this game's imaginary release, there would be a 3 to 4 hour standalone DLC that would follow the alternate timeline where Cole took the powers of the beast. This would mainly just be a crazy power trip for the player because I know a lot of the people who play the evil side like that part of it, but also story wise it would cap off the events of the other major timeline, effectively allowing Sucker Punch to completely move on to other projects, knowing the infamous cannot be revisited as it is completely finished off. This, in my opinion, is the only good solution to the karma problem. The majority of good players could have their game to thrive in, and the subset of bad players can have their power trip of an infamous game, while both of them have more in-depth stories. Also, while we're off topic, uh, and we're all like on spin-off games or whatever and other side stuff, if I were in charge of like the story stuff at Sucker Punch, I would also create a prequel comic that takes place before this game. It would basically just explore Zeke's life and Delson's rise to power and stuff. So with that out of the way, hopefully you do understand why I did the things I did with the karma system. And hopefully you can understand that the infamous games have kind of been held back by the standard with the karma system. And hopefully this solves it, you know, solving both sides, giving good players a good side, bad players a bad side, and kind of everyone wins and we get to solve the problem that has been put forth from the very first game in 2009. With the city of Numeray and the world now aware of Cole's unexpected revival, of course he begins to immediately make new enemies. Thugs begin to break up the crowd surrounding Cole, and Cole must stop them by using his newly acquired amp and his lightning storm ability that he now suddenly remembers. But it doesn't take very long for Fetch to eventually arrive, and when she does, she looks even worse than expected. But to Cole's surprise, she doesn't really ever act in an aggressive manner, and for the most part, she keeps her distance. It's only when one of her thugs aims his weapons at a civilian and Cole risks his life to save them, does she act. She begins to run towards Cole and creates a burst of neon powerful enough to flash and stun him and everyone around him. Then quickly, she runs off, and Cole chases after her using power lines and his static thrust ability, but she's just too fast. As soon as Cole stops to give up, he notices the slight sound of a phone's ringtone coming from his pocket. He grabs the phone and answers a call to find that Fetch is on the other line, and she apologizes for blasting him, but she needed a way to get the phone to him without the others seeing and being suspicious. Afterwards, she explains that these past few years, Delson has gone too far, and he had been killing countless innocent people, and the weight of it has finally gotten to her. With this explanation, Cole realizes that what Jed predicted was absolutely true. She was begging for help, and now she was looking for a way out. This was seemingly impossible before, but now that Cole's back to challenge Delson, she can secretly side with him. 
Cole doesn't fully believe her though and tells her that she's gonna need some good proof that she's on his side. She does so by connecting Cole with a man named Riley Fox, an expert on all things Delson as he has known him all his life. When Riley and Cole finally get connected, Riley explains that he is a fellow conduit as well as a member of the now extinct Akomish tribe. He then elaborates by telling Cole a story, that one day when his tribe was raided by a woman named Augustine, he was brought into the DUP to give up some info on Delson. But of course because he knew Delson from childhood, he trusted him to do the right thing and eventually save his tribe, so he refused to give up any information and thought highly of himself for doing so. But later, Riley would eventually learn the truth, that Delson was more sinister than anyone had imagined when he murdered every single last one of the Akomish tribe members. Riley was absolutely devastated when he learned this information, but just like when he was being interrogated by the DUP, he played the long game and stayed on the sidelines, gaining information and waiting for an opportunity like today, a day to take down Delson. Also, if this character does slightly sound familiar, he is kind of ripped directly from a second son dead drop. He is just mentioned there, he doesn't really have a name or anything, but he is very, very obscure, and now I've just kind of made him a real character with real intentions, but you can definitely treat this person like they're a brand new character. You don't need to know anything about anything in the past, because he's barely mentioned, but now I've just kind of, you know, integrated him into this story, because I thought it would be pretty cool and a nice callback. While Cole doesn't 100% trust Riley, he does have a good feeling about him and decides that going forward, he will judge him based on his actions to see if he's trustworthy. As soon as both of them are done introducing themselves to one another, Riley makes it clear that they should immediately leave the city to get to Delson where he resides in New Empire City. But Cole protests this as he can't just leave the city to rot and says that he needs to leave when New Marais can stand on its own two feet. Riley thinks that this is kind of a waste of time, and states that Cole can't save everyone all the time, even if everyone expects him to, but Cole thinks otherwise. Riley decides that if Cole isn't going to leave the city without helping it, he may as well help out as much as he can to try to fast track the process. Within a few missions, Riley has helped Cole and the player gain a new power, they've done some tutorial missions, some side missions and stuff like that, and generally progress the plot just a little while progressing gameplay quite a bit. If you're wondering why I totally just skipped over the fact that Cole got a new power without explaining it whatsoever, and why my voice might sound different, then congratulations, you've been paying close attention. For some reason, I took the explanation of how Cole got his abilities out of my script with the intention of reworking it later on, but I never actually added it back into the script. So here I am in the future correcting that mistake, and here I go. My idea for how Cole gets his new powers is a combination of all three games, kinda. See, the way Cole gets his new powers in this game is through things I call core reactors. Outside of gameplay, these are used to power cities, and they're basically just upskilled core relays from Second Sun. Throughout history, with every single dictator or tyrant, they always had maybe a couple policies that were actually good intentioned. Like, no matter who you are, you could probably look at them and be like, you know, I guess that's not horrible. They're a horrible person, and it was horribly done, but it, in, the intentions of it weren't that bad. And for Delson, his was clean energy. And that's not just arbitrarily chosen. I actually looked at Delson and I, you know, realized that he's a millennial. He grew up in the Pacific Northwest and he's a Native American. He's a Comish. So it makes a lot of sense for him to probably care a lot about nature and the climate. So of course, when Delson came into his seat of power, one of his first acts was to enforce this upon the rest of the United States. And every single city installed these core reactors, which were just giant core relays into each of their districts, because one of them could power roughly a district of a city. If it was maybe, you know, super energy intensive, maybe two to a district, something like that. So that's how the core relays work story-wise, but gameplay-wise, they would act very similarly to the substations in Infamous 1. So basically in New Marais, when it's made known that Cole is in New Marais, and everyone kind of knows it, Celia goes and turns off the power, and then Cole has to go to a core reactor and turn back on the power, and it's kind of a combination of, you know, Infamous 1 substation system, and you have the giant core relay, so that's Second Sun, and it's got that core prefix, so it uses that energy like in Infamous 2. This would also sort of be how we explain blast shards is that there's a protective, you know, metal barrier sort of around each of the core reactors. It's like a spherical metal barrier type thing. And every time Cole goes and activates a core reactor back up, 
it kind of explodes, sending shrapnel that is irradiated with the core energy around the city. So every single core reactor you activate, it sends more shrapnels around the city. So you can't just go and collect every single blast shard all at once like in the other games. So yeah, that's kind of how he gets his powers and how it works within the story and how it works gameplay wise. And if you're wondering about the specific powers that he does get, that's gonna be all at the end of the video. I don't really have a specific order I want or how it fits in with gameplay. Cause again, this is mainly just story stuff, but I do have a lot of ideas for stuff like that. So if you wanna know all that, wait till the end of the video. The next big story moment happens when Cole decides he needs to get some rest and we get our next big cutscene. Fetch is seen in a surprisingly good mood, having tons of fun at the neon club that she recently has called home. This is cut short of course when Celia arrives with her origami ninjas and scolds Fetch for her lackluster grasp of the situation at hand. Celia explains that if Cole is allowed to parade around the city and dismantle everything that she, sorry, Delson has worked for, then conduits will likely revert back to becoming bioterrorists. Fetch is seemingly high and says that she misses when Celia used to mostly keep her mouth shut. She then tells Celia to look around. The city is more lively than ever and suggests that maybe, just maybe, they're on the wrong side here. She believes that humans and conduits can coexist and by treating humans badly, they might just be making things worse for everyone. As soon as Fetch finishes her rant, Celia's face shows no emotion. Then, she makes a gesture for her ninjas to take away all of Fetch's drugs and to stop the ongoing party at the club. If Fetch wouldn't comply willingly, then Celia would have to make her at any cost if it meant the continuation of the New World Order with her spot at the top. The scene ends with Fetch being dragged off and Celia ordering her ninjas to clean up the club. This would be their temporary home while they stayed in New Marais. We cut to a scene of Cole being fast asleep on a couch when he is suddenly woken up to a ringtone which he slowly answers. Riley is on the other end and says that he has some very bad news. Fetch didn't give him the okay signal this morning and he tells Cole to get to her club to make sure she is okay. Cole travels to Fetch's club and when inside, he searches for Fetch's body assuming that she might have OD'd on something before he is eventually ambushed by ninjas. As Cole is fighting these very fast and very skilled ninjas, he notices that they use a type of gas that is very similar to that at the end of Infamous 1 inside of the balloons. During the fight, Cole inhales a small amount of this gas and eventually when he finally defeats all the ninjas and meets Celia, he notices that she's trying to get into his head and it's clearly shown that she's a skilled manipulator, but it doesn't really work on Cole and he has a line about how he's sick of crazy evil bitches trying to get in his head all the time, a clear reference to Sasha. As Celia notices that her manipulation techniques aren't working on Cole, she has to resort to getting physical. However, by physical, I mean she is seen holding a gas mask of some sort behind her back, which she is clearly intending to use to incapacitate Cole. But as soon as she leaps towards Cole with her gas mask in hand, a stylized cutscene begins that explains an RPG was launched in Cole's general direction, and right as he heard it launch, he also heard a familiar voice yell, Cole, get down. The screen cuts to black, and after a couple seconds, Cole is seen fading in and out of consciousness, but as soon as he finally fully wakes up, he was in a secret location called the clubhouse, where he was met by familiar faces. Zeke and LaRoche were both so happy to see Cole alive and well, and here is where we get the highly anticipated, heartfelt conversation between Zeke and Cole. This conversation will bring up a lot of things, such as Cole's mysterious revival, Zeke's family, and what life has been like for 13 years. LaRoche interrupts them after a few minutes, saying something along the lines of, enough chit chat, let's get shit done before the time runs out, and afterwards they discuss a plan to liberate the city. Basically, LaRoche says that he has had a plan for years on how to get the city back, but he's never had the manpower to do it, until now that Cole's back. LaRoche has a four step plan and these steps include dismantling false propaganda, gathering weapons and munitions, disabling major enemy infrastructure, and finally freeing all of his imprisoned men. These four steps will act as four separate missions that you can do in absolutely any order except for the prison break one which will always come last. This also marks the end of like the major tutorial section of the game and now the player should be about an hour maybe an hour and a half into the game. After Cole is sent to do these missions, he calls Riley and tells him the good news about LaRoche's plan to free the city. Riley is of course glad Cole found his old friends, but thinks that the longer they stay here, the harder it will be to catch Delson unprepared. 
Cole understands where Riley is coming from and agrees that after he helps free LaRoche's men, they can go to New Empire City to take down Delson, but for now, he goes off to accomplish the four missions. During these next couple of missions, there would have to be a lot of dialogue that has to be present, so without going too much into it, I do have some ideas for important conversations that would need to take place, and they'll mostly just happen over the phone, and they go as follows. Zeke and Cole both talk about Zeke's experiences after Cole's death and how he kind of coped with it and his grieving process, and we also get some expansion into Cole's thoughts in the beginning of the game, as well as his thoughts right before he died and right after he got revived. There's also some discussion about Zeke's underground secret agent-esque life during the DUP's reign, and he explains how he helped conduits hide from the DUP when they were in control. Zeke also tells Cole about his family, his kids' names, and reveals that his wife is carrying a son that they plan on naming Cole. And finally, while talking to both LaRoche and Riley, it's clear that they're kind of butting heads for a multitude of reasons, but mainly it's because LaRoche says that Riley, quote, hides behind his phone because he exclusively contacts people through his phone because he's kind of scared of revealing himself, and obviously this makes Riley not like LaRoche back. So those are kind of the main conversations that would take place during the first three missions, but now we're going to get on to the last one and continue with the main story. When completing the final prison break mission where you release all of LaRoche's men from a prison, there's a sudden reveal of a new enemy type. The first wave of enemies that Cole faces take the form of, for lack of a better term, neon zombies, and Cole must immediately defeat them, and after he does so, there's another set of neon enhanced thugs and a neon monster that all ravage the prison. After rescuing LaRoche's men and defeating all of the neon enemies, Cole, Zeke, and LaRoche go back to their main base of operations that they call the Clubhouse. Here, they have a conversation with Riley, who is over the phone, about the recent events at the prison. The conversation begins immediately with the obvious. Celia is probably forcing Fetch to create a neon army of sorts, and Riley suggests that they go save her. LaRoche quickly butts in and notes that, again, when Riley says they, he really means everyone but him because he's too afraid to come out of hiding. Riley immediately shoots an insult back at LaRoche and Cole is forced to step in to shut them both up. Cole says that right now, arguing is a waste of time as they need to focus on making a plan to find Fetch and everyone agrees and the rest of the conversation is them doing so. Afterwards, there's about a mission or two where they eventually find the neon enemies originate from a facility under the cathedral. One of the missions sees Cole, LaRoche, Zeke, and a few of LaRoche's men entering the building and making their way underneath to the facility below. In the cutscenes during this whole mission, you see a hooded individual following the group and staying in the shadows. Eventually, after fighting a bunch of neon enemies and losing all of LaRoche's men, they eventually reach a room that Fetch is being held in, and there they encounter a bunch of origami ninjas who oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the facility. After a couple of minutes and a decently hard fight, Cole is able to take down all of the origami ninjas with little to no injuries, and they finally can go set Fetch free. As Cole and LaRoche walk up to the machine that Fetch is strapped into, Zeke hangs back just a bit to look at the people that are horrifically transforming into their neon counterparts. As Zeke's back is turned, a ninja slowly wakes up from being knocked out on the ground, and with Zeke being the closest to him, the ninja goes in for the kill. Fetch, who is very fatigued, is the only one watching this happen, and she gasps in shock as the ninja starts to get up. Both Cole and LaRoche notice this and look over at the very last moment of the ninja's mad dash towards Zeke, but it's too late for anyone to do anything. That is, until the hooded stranger from before stands right in front of the ninja's path and takes the full force of the blade. But surprisingly, this does absolutely nothing to the stranger, and the paper sword instantly crumbles before one punch from the man knocks the ninja right onto the ground. For a couple of seconds, the room stands in absolute silence before Zeke finally thanks the stranger and asks who he is. The stranger slowly begins to remove his hood, and a man seemingly made entirely of light blue crystal stands before them. Out of pure speculation, Cole says, Riley? And the crystal man confirms that he is in fact, Riley Fox. Of course, everyone is surprised by this, and now they all have a lot of loyalty and respect towards Riley, and LaRoche has a lot more respect towards him because he saved Zeke and understood now why Riley only talked exclusively over the phone. 
After this reveal, they all have a discussion on what to do with Fetch, but she immediately ends the discussion when she decides for them. She says that she wants to be put behind bars for both her own good and because she thinks she deserves it after all that she's done. Everyone respects her wishes, but they also know that they can't just take her back to a normal prison cell, so instead they construct a makeshift one that's at the clubhouse, and that one can help her get over her withdrawals and also keep her safe from Delson. While Fetch stays in her makeshift cell and gets some rest, Cole does some other missions that progress the gameplay side of things, as well as help out LaRoche's men, who still need some final assistance. One mission specifically would be Cole assisting Riley to help a pilot, so when they eventually leave for New Empire City, they already have one set up. And finally, Cole finishes powering up the rest of the city and gets a new power or two, but again, we'll talk about that at the end of the video. The next major story moment is a big one, and it comes when Fetch wants to talk with Cole in her cell. When Cole finally arrives at the clubhouse, Zeke hands him Fetch's next drug dose and says that he has lowered the dosage once again, and Cole carries the needle down to the basement. When Cole first walks into the unfinished basement, the first thing he notices is the makeshift prison cell along with the small TV that sits outside of it. The next thing he notices is how much physical suffering Fetch continues to endure, caused by both the power siphoning from Celia, as well as her withdrawals, and it's obvious that she's at her lowest point physically, but hugely to her credit, Cole notices that she's actually surprisingly positive mentally. When Cole first brings this up, she explains that her transition into fighting with the good guys has brought her an incredible change in perspective. She goes on to say that she no longer has the world at her mercy, but honestly, that's a good thing. She never really loved hurting others as much as Delson, and now that she's a good guy, she can just undo all the pain she's caused. But suddenly, out of nowhere it seems like, Cole stifles her optimism with some questions about her true intentions. Cole believes that she may just feel good because she's on good terms and she might be able to fix her reputation, but he needs to know that she's doing this for the right reasons. She sets Cole's mind at ease when she says that even after they take down Delson, she is 100% willing to go on trial and even go to prison for the rest of her life for her crimes, and Cole then feels better about her intentions. Fetch and Cole then go on to talk about the main reason Fetch called Cole in here to begin with, which is both Cole's actual power level and how he grew to become just as power hungry as Augustine. First off, she explains how Delson's powers, while they are very powerful, aren't actually limitless. He does like to put that out there to make everyone believe it, but there is a limit to his powers. It turns out that when Delson went to Kurt and Kay and he took every single person's powers, he did end up getting all of them, but after a couple of months, he learned that if he didn't use a power in a certain amount of time, he ended up losing it. Effectively, this means that he did gain all of the most useful ones and all the ones that he thought were the coolest and the ones he used the most often, but he did lose a vast majority of them that could be kind of useful in very specific situations. So really technically if you think about it, this isn't really a physical limit, this is more of a mental limit because let's say Delson did have hundreds or thousands of powers, he would have to go and juggle all of them and he would spend all of his time juggling powers and he couldn't get anything done. So now we know that the few dozen that Delson will have, he's very skilled with and he uses them quite a bit. And finally, Fetch and Cole's conversation comes to an end when she explains that Delson had become just like Augustine and that they need to be willing to do anything to take him down because she knows from personal experiences that he will do anything, even kill millions if he has to, to keep his seat of power. With their conversation finally over, Cole goes to hand her the needle that Zeke had handed him, but just as their hands begin to touch, a spark reaches from Cole's hand over to hers and she quickly pulls it away. Cole instantly apologizes for this and says that it actually hasn't happened since he first got his powers, but other than that, he doesn't really think much of it. Fetch has a kind of confused look on her face, but says that it's totally okay, and as Cole gets up to leave, he states that he's gonna go get some sleep. As he's leaving the room, Fetch has a more confused look on her face, and she stares down at her hand, and the screen fades to black with the message, two hours later. The next scene shows Cole laying in a nice looking bed within the comfort of the clubhouse's loft, but despite this, he's still tossing and turning and seemingly not getting any sleep. Because of his growing frustration, he yanks a pillow out of his bed and walks down the stairs where he checks on Zeke and LaRoche who are sleeping on separate couches. Being very careful as to not wake anyone else up, Cole exits the building before climbing the building's roof where he lies on the cold ground with only his pillow. 
This oddly seems to be more comfortable for him as the others have had years to process the past events, but for him, the blast was just a few short months ago, so he's still not used to the silence, and it's kind of hinted that he does have a little bit of PTSD. Soon after he lays down, there's another fade, but this time, it's not been two hours, it's been six. As the screen fades back into color, the camera pans down from the early morning sky to reveal that Cole is sound asleep, when slowly, a faint rumble grows in the distance. At this point, Cole is kind of half awake and half asleep, and at first, it's just rumbling alone, so it kind of becomes a white noise to him, but slowly, he starts hearing shouting, crying, sirens, and eventually an explosion. Colt immediately jerks awake and rushes to see where his friends are, but none of them are present in the clubhouse. And as he goes down to the cell where Fetch is, thankfully he finds that she is still there. When Fetch sees Cole, she asks what's happening, but Cole has absolutely no idea, and he asks where the others went, but she's just as clueless. Cole goes back up to the loft where he had left his phone the night prior and finds that they have called him over a dozen times, but when he tries to call back, nobody answers. The ground shakes violently once more, and Cole decides that wherever they are, it's probably in that direction. He wished that they would go the opposite direction, but they're not that smart. As Cole leaves the clubhouse, he sees a news chopper fly past him, and he follows it to the source of the rumbling, finding dozens of buildings have been completely leveled by a giant concrete monster. Without a second thought, Cole begins to chase the monster around the city, and eventually after a while, he destroys it by defeating the many concrete soldiers that seem to be controlling and guiding it throughout the city. As the monster begins to fall to the ground, and Cole finally thinks himself victorious, Troy Baker's familiar voice congratulates Cole on his victory. Cole turns sharply towards the voice to see Delson sitting atop a giant concrete pillar wearing Cole's iconic yellow and black leather jacket. Delson begins to introduce himself, but Cole states that he already knew who he was. Delson kind of seems flattered by this fact and says, I'm sure they were all good things, right? But Cole doesn't say anything to this, and instead just lets Delson talk until he reveals what he really wants. Delson soon reveals this when he smoke dashes down to Cole's level and says that he really only wants one thing. He wants to shake his hand. Nothing more, nothing less. Of course, Cole was told that this is how Delson steals powers, and he pulls his hand behind his back before balling it into a fist. This single move makes Delson's face turn from a confident smile to a determined smirk as he puts his hand down as well. Cole says that Delson doesn't deserve to wear that jacket, but Delson thinks otherwise. See, he got this jacket because back when the DUP ruled, he was the only one strong enough to stand up to them, and in doing so, Zeke gave him a token of approval from the greatest conduit alive. Cole doesn't accept that Zeke gave him that jacket, and Delson says, Oh really? Why don't you ask him yourself, before revealing that he has captured Zeke, Riley, and LaRoche. Delson doesn't actually allow Zeke to respond, as their mouths are all covered in concrete, but he just needed Cole to see that he had all of his friends captured. It's also important to note that Delson didn't personally capture all of them, he had his men do it, and also he doesn't know who Riley is. Delson tells Cole once again to give him his power or he would kill his friends in front of the whole world, as he gestures to the news helicopter and there's a cut where you can see Fetch watching all of this unfold on the news. As Cole looks around the environment, kind of gauging whether he should fight Delson or not as that's his first instinct, he looks over to Zeke and considers his family. Cole's conscience just simply wouldn't allow him to put Zeke's life at risk if it meant widowing his wife, and he decides that the only option he has is to give up his powers, and he holds his hand out for Delson to take it. Because of Delson's very greedy attitude, he is quick to grab Cole's hand, but when their hands meet, a burst of lightning continually shoots all around them, sparking absolutely everywhere, and both Cole and Delson scream out in pain. This goes on for probably about 5-10 to 10 seconds, when suddenly Fetch arrives to the scene and blasts Delson out of the way using a neon shockwave. This action both symbolizes that Fetch has been redeemed, and that she could leave her cell at basically any time, but she chose not to because she thought she deserved it. While Delson is getting up from the ground, you can see in his face that he is absolutely furious, and he immediately tries to shoot both Fetch and Cole with smoke, but nothing happens. Delson's first thought is that he must have run out of smoke, and as he turns to absorb it, he finds that again, nothing is happening. He immediately looks down at his hand, and he feels something that he hasn't felt in a while. He's vulnerable. 
and you can see in his eyes that he's both fearful and confused. Suddenly, the camera switches to a shot of a helicopter, and the woman narrating the news is wondering what everyone else is. Did Cole just take away one of Delson's powers? Suddenly, in Delson's most vulnerable moment, Celia shows up right beside him, and she helps take him to safety. Cole looks over to Fetch and asks what just happened between him and Delson, and Fetch gives an excited answer. Fetch reveals that back when Cole handed her the needle and she got shocked by him, she wondered why the feeling felt so familiar. That is, until she was watching the news and it clicked. It was the exact same feeling she had when the DUP had used power dampeners on her at Curtin K, and this time, it just felt a little bit more powerful or potent. But suddenly, right after Fetch had revealed that, her mouth, arms, and legs were all wrapped up in wires, and she was dragged up to Delson and Celia's level atop a concrete pillar. Fetch could see that Delson was finally at his breaking point, as he told her how much he was disappointed in her, and how his image might be tarnished because of what she allowed Cole to do. He would show everyone in the world that nobody was safe from him, that he was still the strongest conduit in the world, even if he lost one of his powers. Delson suddenly faced the news helicopter that had been capturing this whole event alive, and with his magnetic power, he slowly pulled it towards him to get a closer shot. As Delson saw how absolutely helpless Fetch was, he finally allowed her to speak her final words as one last act of friendship. Fetch said in a somber tone, What would Reggie think of you now, Delson? What would he think of the world you have created? At first, this kind of shocked Delson, but as he glanced over at Celia, he was reminded of something she once said, and with his chain, he formed a neon sword, not hesitating to stab it through Fetch's chest before repeating what Celia had once said to him, that Reggie was only human. When the neon sword had pierced Fetch's chest, it also broke the wires that were holding her arms in place, and she knew what she had to do. With her final words, she said, I'm coming Brent, before forming a neon singularity that tore the whole area apart, allowing Cole and his friends to escape. Almost immediately after the singularity is created, a stylized cutscene begins that shows how the singularity allowed Cole and his friends to escape, and also how Fetch died due to it. Of course, Delson and Celia escaped too, but they didn't stay in New Marais. They traveled immediately back to New Empire City to fortify their base. The stylized cutscene ends, and a new cutscene shows Cole and company conversing about what to do, but it's pretty clear that they need to travel immediately to New Empire City to stop Delson. This is because Cole realizes that Riley is kind of right. The longer he stays in Numeray, the more danger he puts its citizens in, and he can't save everyone. He needs to right now go and stop Delson, which would do the most good for the most amount of people. Before leaving the city, Cole goes to talk to Zeke, who reveals that he won't be staying in Numeray or going with Cole to New Empire City. He explains that he has a family and he needs to go be with them. For as much fun as this has been, he can't bear the thought of widowing his wife, and now that he's been in a very dangerous situation, he really just wants to go be with them and not put himself in any more danger. Of course, Cole completely understands this, and he says his final goodbyes to Zeke, as well as LaRoche, who he is entrusting the safety of the city. The end of the cutscene shows Zeke and LaRoche watching as Riley and Cole get onto the charter plane before heading off to New Empire City to take down the mad tyrant Delson Rowe. Delson and Celia are seen back at Delson's throne room, and by their conversation, they've been talking for a bit about one topic, Cole. It's obvious by the way Delson's talking that he's still fearful of Cole's ability to take his powers away, but Celia is pretty calm in her composure. Delson simply can't understand how she's so calm. He has dozens of powers, but if Cole got to her, then she would be powerless forever. She is well aware of this though, and assures Delson that she has a plan. She just needs some time, and he needs to relax. Despite this, Delson continues to be worried and says that Cole must be planning to make his way to the city as they speak. Again, Celia confidently tells him that he should not be worried. He is still the most powerful conduit in the world, and it will stay that way as long as he trusts her. Delson then begins to take a deep breath, reminding himself that Celia is still the only person left in the world that he either trusts and or will take advice from and then afterwards, he commands his men to lock down the city and let nobody enter or leave. This should at least buy Celia enough time for her to get pretty far in her plan, whatever it may be. 
The cutscene ends with the camera slowly zooming out to reveal Delson's main base of operations, a giant concrete space needle in the middle of one of the islands of New Empire City. The next scene shows Cole and Riley playing a game of chess on their plane ride, and by the looks of it, Cole is seen to be winning. During this game of chess, they have a conversation about Riley's perception of the recent events, and what their strategy for getting Delson should be. At the end of the conversation, Riley has a line about how they will need to act as fast as they can if they want to take down Delson, and right after, he puts Cole in check. Cole then tells Riley that he must be a bad teacher if Cole hasn't won a single game, and Riley responds by saying something along the lines of, there's no such thing as beginner's luck when you're playing against someone that's as good as I am. But right after Riley says that, they hear a sudden explosion and the plane ride becomes very unstable. Over the intercom, the pilot told them both to strap in, and a stylized cutscene begins that explains how Cole got sucked out of the plane, but that Riley was able to quickly get his seatbelt on, so he went down with it. Of course, this doesn't imply that he died, but that Cole, now stranded and alone outside the city, must find him. Cole immediately begins his journey to the main bridge that connects the city to the mainland, only to find that it's been nearly completely destroyed. This doesn't stop him though, as he continues to move forward, traversing the bridge and entering the new and improved Heights District of New Empire City. This district is what used to be the Neon, before the beast turned into a giant crater, so they rebuilt it as the high-end and luxurious part of the city, home to all the skyscrapers and rich people, properly renaming it the Heights District. But of course, it's not all perfect, as Cole will soon learn. Once again, I'm going to stop the story now to explain myself a little bit more and explain my reasoning for having two different maps in one game. To some people, that might seem like a lot of work on the developer's parts, but the way I see it, they can kill two birds with one stone. They can both remaster the old maps while at the same time reimagining the newer ones that are set 13 years in the future. The remasters could then be used for an infamous 1 and 2 remaster, because let's be honest, they really deserve to be remastered, and the new ones can be both familiar, yet overhauled for this new generation of consoles. So yeah, that's kind of just my excuse for having two different maps, because these games do need remasters, and this would allow them to start the groundwork on the map remasters, which would be a good portion of it. Also, I hope you now know that this is what I meant by developer's limits, that I can't just, you know, say, oh, this game, we're going to have the whole entire East Coast be a map, or this game, we're going to, you know, have 10 different endings. I wanted to keep the developer's limits in mind, because having just two different maps with no secondary reason would seem like quite a bit of work. And now with that out of the way, kind of just pushing that aside for people who might have been wondering, let's get back to the story. When Cole first enters the Heights District, he is immediately stunned by the differences he notices between it and the old Neon District, but he still continues moving on, following the plane's smoke to find Riley. But upon arriving at the crash site, he finds that nobody is there, and he begins to get a little bit worried. He thinks of what to do before calling Riley's phone, and to his surprise, he actually picks up. But the person who spoke was not Riley. The man who picked up the phone had a heavy Italian accent and said that his name was James Valentino, but that his friends called him Jimmy. And just to fill the gap between what Cole and Riley experienced, there would also be a few dead drops that Cole could pick up later, explaining what I'm about to explain next, which is Riley's point of view. After the plane crashed, the first thing that Riley remembered was waking up inside of a cell in the middle of what looked like an interrogation room. The room had about half a dozen people in it, some of whom spoke with a heavy Italian accent. He tried to question them about where he was, but nobody was responding to him. They were all just talking like they were friends at work, and this was all just normal. At first, he was fearful that this must have meant he got caught by Delson's agents, but the operation inside of this room looked a little bit too organized to be set up by Delson. As he kept looking around the room, he saw another couple of men rummaging through his suitcase that they must have found from inside the plane crash, and just as he was about to yell at them, a heavy set man in a suit walked into the room and began questioning Riley. He asked Riley what he was doing here, and Riley responded with the truth. He was here to kill Delson. He said this because he suspected that these people were against Delson as well, due to their level of what seemed like organization and stability. Also, if Riley didn't know about their organization prior, he decided that they must be pretty good at their job, so ultimately he should trust them. 
The man responded to Riley's claim that he was going to kill Delson with a hearty laugh and asked how the hell Riley was going to kill someone as powerful as Delson. Just then, Riley's phone rang inside of the suitcase and the man went over to pick it up. He saw the caller ID said Cole on it and asked Riley who it was. Riley, having a smug look on his face, simply responded, that's how I'm going to kill Delson. Jumping back to Cole, he talked to Jimmy and Riley for a while and ultimately they all decided to team up under one condition. Cole needed to do a few favors for Jimmy that would end up helping out his district-wide mob that he was the leader of. In the meantime, Riley said that he was going to plan a time and a route for Cole to infiltrate Delson's main base that spanned throughout all of what used to be the historic district that Delson predictably and egotistically named the Row District. As Cole went to complete all of Jimmy's missions, to his surprise, he found that all the favors that he had Cole do seemed like they would actually help the general public. Cole kind of assumed that the missions he would be doing were going to be pretty shady because they call themselves a mob, but actually he was doing things like helping out ambulances and collecting supplies and destroying weapon caches, not collecting them. This is all how Cole learned that the Valentino mob in the Heights was actually the main form of justice and policing for the public, since Delson's army was full of narcissistic and cruel men who only had their own interests in mind. And while we're talking about Delson's army, right now this is a nice time to bring up that all the main enemies of the city, and especially this part of the city, are Delson's lower level concrete soldiers who were all former DUP agents. These kind of just serve as your normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill, just soldier-type enemy. They don't have anything special about them, really, but later on, I will introduce higher-level concrete soldiers, as well as a new enemy type that I think is pretty creative. Later in the story, Cole would learn that Jimmy sent him to do these missions for two reasons. First off, he knew that if Cole and Riley were to not trust them, this would be a good way to kind of bond them together, to know that they have good faith, and both of them want the best for the city. And second, he knew that if Cole were to do these missions of what looked like his own free will, then it would kind of take the spotlight off of the mob because Delson was getting closer and closer to getting them revealed, and because they involved direct conflict with Delson's army, he knew that the mob couldn't carry these missions out, so Cole doing them is kind of a win-win for everybody. Eventually, with all the missions complete, Riley calls Cole and informs him that he finally found a way to infiltrate Delson's base and that they need to meet up as soon as possible. Once they met up, Riley quickly laid out the plan that surprisingly had very little detail. First, at night, Cole would have to sneak across the very fortified bridge to the Row District and make his way to Delson's Concrete Space Needle if that was even possible. Once he arrives to the tower, if he's not yet dead, he would have to make his way up the needle and take Delson's powers away, if, again, that was even possible. Cole thought that this seemed a little bit rushed and optimistic, but trusted that when Riley said he did his homework and that this was their only shot, that he was telling the truth, so he went along with the plan. After just a few short hours, when the time was finally right, he traveled across the bridge just as expected, but unexpectedly, when he first stepped foot on the main island, he was blinded by multiple spotlights hitting him. He instantly tried blocking the light with his hand, but it still took a few seconds for him to adjust to the brightness. As soon as Cole's eyes were used to the light and he could see again, a few of the spotlights moved on to focus on Delson, who was stood on a concrete structure directly in front of him. Cole watched as Delson quickly used his video ability to fly down to his level and slowly walk towards him, all the while boasting about how he was prepared for all this to happen. As Delson continued to boast about his situation and slowly walk closer to Cole, Cole sensed that he only had one opportunity and shot his hand towards Delson's just to see it completely pass through. As Delson's eyes shifted from his hand back up to Delson, he saw that he was slightly glitching. And Delson, in his hologram form, cracked a cocky smile and said, you think you're the only one that has a trick up their sleeve? And made a gesture to his men before completely disappearing. Immediately after Delson's gesture, nine high-ranking concrete officers who were standing in various positions created a giant concrete monster that Cole had to fight as it slowly began to push him across the bridge that he came in on and back into the Heights District. As the monster was in its final seconds of life, its giant concrete tail swung around and smacked the ever-living shit out of Cole, sending him flying back across the final section of the bridge and into a building. 
This knocks Cole out completely, and we now get to see a cutscene with Delson and Celia in his throne room that is set just minutes prior. Delson begins to smile with joy as he looks down at Cole's battle with the giant concrete monster. But as this is happening, Celia storms into the room and informs Delson that the plan was to stall for time, not show off. Delson states that he just had to show Cole that this was his city now, and Celia tells Delson that he can't be acting on his fears and insecurities. He needs to adjust. Seemingly out of nowhere, Delson turns sharply towards her and angrily says, To just wait? Is that what you were gonna say? How can I even trust that you have a plan and you're not just talking out of your ass until you eventually figure something out? In response to this, all Celia does is squint at Delson and say, Fine before gesturing to one of her ninjas for them to bring her a blueprint that the player never gets to actually see. Once the blueprint is revealed to Delson, he slowly looks up and down it before exclaiming, holy shit, that could all be unstoppable, as the camera slowly starts to shift towards Celia before she says, yeah, you. Cole suddenly shoots awake to find he is safe among friends and his first thought is about his throbbing headache and rightly explains to him that Delson shut off the power so that's why he feels like crap. But as soon as Cole could fully think and remember the past events, he angrily asked Riley how the hell he didn't know that he would be ambushed and Riley says that he's truly sorry. This time, he just rushed it and didn't cover all of his bases. Additionally, he says that the information that he used must have been purposefully leaked because Delson wanted this to happen and Cole just says to Riley that from now on, he needs to get it right and not rush his process. Riley completely agrees with Cole and takes the criticism to heart, but corrects Cole by saying that there won't be a next time, as Cole looks out the window to see a giant concrete wall that separates Delson's island from the rest of them. As they keep talking, they conclude that first, Cole has to turn on the power, and then Riley can get to work on how to solve their wall situation. Cole gets right on the power problem, and travels straight to the Heights District core reactor to turn it on. After doing so, the next sort of big story mission comes from Jimmy, who says that his men keep being abducted more and more often, and he wants to find out why with the help of Cole. As soon as Cole arrives to their agreed upon location, he sees that Jimmy has set up a trap to capture the people who keep abducting his men. Jimmy states that this is actually only one of three traps that are set up around the city and Cole has to kind of try and watch all three to see when the abductors will show up. And for the traps themselves, it kind of looks like it's a combination of tripwires, snipers, and laser sensors, all very well hidden, surrounding a single mannequin in the middle that is made to look like one of Jimmy's men. As Cole parades around the city checking on each location, he eventually concludes that this isn't going to work, and Jimmy calls him back to the first location where he sees a very, very stupid idea. Cole sees that in the middle of the trap, they no longer have a mannequin, but now a person has volunteered to be the bait for the abductor. Additionally, he also insisted that the countermeasures be taken away, so the whole situation just looks more believable. Cole looks over to Jimmy and asks what the hell happened while he was gone, and Jimmy states that he was against this happening, but the man who volunteered insisted because his best friend was abducted and he wanted to find out why. Cole asks how getting a man kidnapped is in any way going to help them out, and Jimmy explains that they have the volunteer's phone tracked, so all Cole has to do is chase after them as soon as he's taken. Cole then goes to talk to the volunteer to make sure this is what he really wants and talks to him about the realities of the situation, but the volunteer is very clearly serious about this, and after that conversation, they all sit and wait for the abduction. After about 10 minutes or so, just as everyone is getting a little bit impatient, they hear an explosion in the distance, and as they all turn to look at it, the man is abducted. Immediately after noticing this, Cole pulls out his phone and begins to track the man and his abductor, and eventually he is led into the sewers. While continuing to track the man and traversing through the very familiar sewers, Cole eventually finds the culprit, an origami ninja carrying the man they used as bait. When the ninja eventually notices that Cole is getting too close, he stops and hits him with a gas grenade that causes Cole to heavily hallucinate. While Cole is basically incapacitated on the ground, we get some of his abstract thoughts through the hallucinations about stuff like his childhood, Kessler, maybe some stuff with Trish, and his death. As you may be able to tell, this would kind of just be used as a character moment so we can see more of Cole's inside and see his thoughts and feelings without any sort of filter. 
But eventually, when Cole comes into his own consciousness, he is somehow out of the sewers and decides to call Jimmy. As Cole continues to explain what happened, Jimmy becomes very worried because if Celia is truly behind all of these kidnappings, then what's happening to them would be nothing less than sadistic. Jimmy begins to repeat a rumor he heard about the story behind Celia's ninjas, and it leaves Cole with a horrific new insight on the mind behind Celia and how she truly operates. According to the rumor, the first step in becoming an origami ninja is to first willingly cut off your own tongue in a swear of silence to Celia's cause. And if you thought that that was kind of messed up, it's only after the fact that you've done that that you are now finally being considered to become a ninja, and if it turns out you're not cut out for it, the other ones are ordered to kill you off, and because you're so loyal to her, you willingly give up your life. And finally, the ones that are the best of the best that eventually become ninjas become so loyal to Celia that they don't even recognize their previous life as their own anymore. It becomes a secondary person that they can't even remember that they totally dissociate from. At first, Jimmy assumed that this was a thing you volunteered to do for some weird reason, but now he assumes that there's some sort of brainwashing involved if she is literally taking people right off the streets who are very highly trained and have been fighting against her for the past few years. Additionally, why does she need a bunch of random civilians that she keeps taking off the streets if she needs highly trained ninjas at her disposal? While Cole and Jimmy ponder this, Riley calls for a group meetup because he may have found the only way to make it past the giant concrete wall. When everyone arrives at the meetup spot, Jimmy eagerly asks Riley about the way that they'll make it past the wall, but first, Riley lays out his thought process before revealing what he found. He says that initially, he looked for the ways that they might possibly go over or under the wall, but that those just weren't going to happen. Apparently, the wall extends far underground, cutting off even the sewers and any external power, and with the troops set up on top of the wall, it would be impossible to fly over it without getting shot down. With both of those options out of the equation, it left Riley with only one option. They have to destroy the wall. But not just a small part of it, they have to somehow destroy most, if not all of it. If they don't, they risk that the wall gets fixed super fast, but if they can destroy most, if not all of it, and get enough forces to raid the island, they can cripple Delson's army enough to keep the wall down for good. After hearing this, Jimmy asks how the hell this is good news. They don't have any way to destroy the wall, and they still don't have nearly enough men to raid it. Riley addresses the part about destroying the wall first, saying that the only way to destroy the wall is by using hundreds of highly explosive bombs set up at weak points around the wall. For this, he asks Cole if he would call Zeke to work on maybe whipping up a blueprint for them, and Cole agrees to contact Zeke about it. Before addressing the final thing that they would need, the actual army to raid the island, Riley told Jimmy that he might want to take a seat, because he would absolutely hate this next part. After they have the blueprint for the bombs, the only way to manufacture them and to get enough men to raid the island is to ally with the scavengers in the Warren district. Jimmy immediately begins to stand up, saying that there is absolutely no way that the scavengers are going to side with him. There's no way, not after what happened. Cole tells Jimmy to calm down before asking what exactly he means by this, and Jimmy recalls a story that took place just four years prior, and it's shown as a stylized cutscene. After seven long years of rebuilding, everyone in New Empire City was finally ready to start their new lives and just be happy for once. As the city got closer and closer to its grand reinstatement, they held an election for its new mayor. There were many choices, but the two that stood out were Maggie Thompson and Wilson Valentino, Jimmy's father. Maggie Thompson was born and raised in the Industrial Warren District. She had major business ties and streamlined nearly every single part of the process to help with the rebuilding effort. She really was a woman of the people and had a cult following in the Warren. Wilson, on the other hand, was a political man and promised things that seemed impossible. He had a vision for the city that seemed like it was so grand it was outside the realm of possibility, and the people of the Heights District absolutely loved him. This may have seemed like a situation that would cause divide, but the two candidates made it very clear that the city came first, and no matter who won, this would be a win for the city. That is, until the night before the election, when Maggie was found dead in her apartment, shot with the very same gun that Wilson would occasionally flaunt as his family heirloom. 
the exact same gun that Jimmy brandished with him at all times. This murder created a massive tension and divide between the two districts, and the riots became a daily occurrence. Wilson swore that he didn't do it, but the citizens of the Warren didn't care. They saw the evidence, and it was enough to warrant their outrage. This whole situation spanned about five days before finally, Delson arrived in the city and supplied everyone the quote, justice that they all wanted. And he killed Wilson on live television, granting this city his and his alone. Just as a side note, this whole entire thing would actually even be more in depth and more explained in the prequel comic if that were to exist, if this game were to exist, and it would explain further that Celia was actually the person who murdered Maggie because she wanted to create some tension between the residents, so when Delson arrived in the city, he could just kill the bad guy and easily just slide into power, and it would just be a better way of showing her very manipulative nature. Now knowing the full story, Cole turned to Riley and asked if there was any other way that they could possibly make this work, but Riley said that from what he's seen, this is their only option. So it's settled. Cole and Riley will travel up the Jefferson Tunnel into the Warren District and try to convince the scavengers to team up with them and Jimmy's mob to take down the wall and stop Delson. Jimmy thinks about all that's been said and he notes that it may be hard or impossible, but if it's truly the only way that they can get this done, then they're going to have to make it work. As Cole makes his way towards the Jefferson Tunnel to travel up to the Warren, he contacts Zeke about making the bombs. Of course, Zeke says that he's completely happy to help, and even though he knows he's being safe where he's at, he still does kind of miss the action, and he misses being with Cole and fighting the bad guys, but Cole makes sure to tell him that he's being safe and that's what Cole wants. During this phone call, Cole also gets to talk to Zeke's daughters and his wife, and it's very clear that Zeke is really happy and he has a very happy family, and Cole would do anything to keep them safe. As soon as Cole arrives to the Warren district, he finds that his power has been shut off and he also discovers that the society here functions pretty differently compared to the Heights. For most average people, life in the Heights is basically just business as usual. Yeah, there might be daily deaths and explosions, but people still have to live their lives relatively normal. In the Warren, however, this is not the case. The whole district feels like it's in complete lockdown and everyone has boarded up windows, plus guns are a must have. This seems to be something that's very consistent with the Warren District as it's been like this basically the whole time it's ever existed. It's always been kind of the rundown part of the city to have all the lower end things and it's always going through some sort of crisis. It also doesn't help because of that whole Maggie situation and Delson arriving to the city that everyone's kind of in a weird state of paranoia where they only want to rely on themselves for everything and this has led to their current situation because they won't ask for any outside help. Cole would soon realize this after turning on the power and going to meet up with a group of scavengers who just finished fighting Delson's soldiers. He asked the group if he and Riley, who was not currently there at the time, could somehow talk to their leader because he had found a way to take down the wall and stop Delson. One man in the group that looked a bit different from the rest spoke up and said that they don't have one leader and they don't allow anyone to meet up with their council until they've shown their good faith. Cole says that he has turned on the power and that that should count as good faith, but they repeat that everyone who meets with the council has to show their good faith. Cole quickly picks up that this means Riley has to do something as well, and they both go do a mission together to show that they want to help and they eventually get to meet with the council. But during that mission that Cole and Riley go do to show their good faith, it's shown how truly powerful Riley is once he has to get his hands dirty, and Cole thinks to himself that it's a shame that he's mostly stuck planning things because as a fighter, he's actually pretty skilled. When Cole and Riley eventually arrive in the council's room after being invited, they see five seats that are equally spaced apart, and each seat has a different member of the council that are totally anonymous as they go by numbers, not names. As soon as they're stood in front of the council, Riley is the first to speak up, telling the council about his plan to destroy the wall with bombs that are currently developing as they speak, and everything goes fine until he mentions teaming up with Jimmy Valentino and his mob. As soon as Riley proposes that the scavengers and the mob team up, the council all begin to bicker amongst themselves until number two in the council silences them. She says that while they might not like it, this may be the only way to end their suffering in this city. And because they now have the opportunity to actually kill Delson and fix things, they have to set any amount of pride away and take it. 
Shortly after number two finished her speech, the council sat in silence before eventually number five asked to put it to a vote, and by the end, it's three to two in favor of helping. But quickly after the vote finishes, number four brings up a good point. He says that while now they are all willing to help, they might not even be able to. As of recently, they have been completely forced out of all of their manufacturing facilities by Delson's troops and Celia's ninjas. Number 4 says that they would need those facilities to produce any sort of bombs on a scale large enough for what they would need, and Cole immediately gets to work on freeing the facilities, and while doing so, he becomes curious as to why Delson needs them at all. Of course, you the player might realize that Celia's men and Delson's troops taking over these facilities is somehow connected to the blueprint that Celia showed Delson, but Cole doesn't know that, so he's still kind of left in the dark. After finally freeing all of the facilities from Delson and Celia's control, he meets back up with the council and they get to work on manufacturing the explosives. Also during this final meeting, number two volunteered to be the operational leader for this whole situation, and she would from now on help Riley, Cole, and Jimmy with the coordination efforts, but mostly she focused on stuff in the Warren, just like Jimmy did with the Heights. And speaking of Jimmy, this whole time while Riley and Cole were solving stuff in the Warren, him and his mob were trying to find leads on where his people were being taken, and finally, he called Cole because he found something. After traveling back to the heights, Cole talked to Jimmy who guided him into the sewers on the west side of the island where they found a piece of the puzzle. Jimmy explains that while one of his men were exploring the sewers trying to find a lead on where the men were being taken, they stumbled upon an old research facility. After reporting this finding to Jimmy, he came to take a look and knew that it had to be important. This was all being explained to Cole right before he walked into the ransacked room, and at first he was confused about what he was seeing until he saw a First Son's helmet sitting on a table right next to the First Son's logo plastered on the wall. Cole continued examining the completely destroyed facility before asking if Jimmy and his men caused this mess, and Jimmy says that they found it like this. This piqued Cole's interest, and as he continued to examine the room, he saw dozens of blueprints lying on the ground. Cole carefully examined every single blueprint he came across, but to his surprise, none of them that he found were at all lethal. Because of Cole's understandably very negative perception of the First Sons, he expected to find prototype laser guns or handheld nuclear reactors, not state-of-the-art water filtration systems and Dyson Sphere calculations. But really, those are only the papers that he could understand. A lot of the stuff he looked at was just so complex that he couldn't even comprehend it. Cole continued to find more and more things like this, but as he continued to find them, a dark thought came to his mind. If all of the blueprints and papers that he found were very passive things and things that honestly would help out humanity, then the dangerous things must have been taken by someone. Cole continues to look around the facility until finally he finds a digital map of other secret First Sons bases that lie beneath the surface of the city. Of course, the map has not been updated, so it is still styled after the old Empire City, and the one that they are in is labeled as Research, while the one in the northeast of the Neon is labeled as Development, but below it says it's offline. There are two more facilities in the Warren, with the one on the south side being labeled as Testing Lab, but the northern one caught Cole's eye. It was labeled as Rayfield Containment. And finally, the last laboratory sat in the northern half of the Historic District, but it seemed to be the most important as well as the most mysterious because it had no label. This caught Cole's eye and after he was done examining the map, he stated that he was going to go get some rest and then in the morning, he was going to go look at the other bases to see what he could find. After Cole got some very much deserved sleep, he woke up to go check out the Raysphere Containment Lab because to him, it seemed to be the most interesting. As soon as Cole arrived, he blasted open the door only to find that the whole facility was completely dark. He found the power after a while, and once he turned it on, he discovered that the entire place was stripped down to nothing. But before Cole could investigate further, he got a call from Riley, who said that they had finished preparations for the raid, and that they need to meet up as soon as possible. With seemingly nothing left to discover in the room, Cole made his way to help out with the raid on the wall, with their first step being to lower the bridge between the Warren and the Heights District, allowing all the forces to meet up and spread to different points of attack. As soon as everyone was in position, Riley had the privilege to press the button that detonated Zeke's custom thermite bombs that were lined on the outer wall that all blew up in a blaze of glory. 
This act created dozens of weak points all along the outer shell of the wall that were further weakened by barrages of RPGs launched by both the scavengers and the mob as they worked together as a team. Cole continues to stare at the wall, fascinated at the scene at hand, but the camera suddenly cuts to Delson and Celia, who are sitting atop the wall, watching this whole event unfold. Both of them are pretty worried, but Celia is at least trying to hide it. Delson, in an obvious attempt to calm his own nerves, out loud says that he has ordered all of his troops to guard the entrance, and it should definitely be enough. But Celia, having already accepted what's about to happen, tells Delson that it definitely won't be enough. And as Delson turns to her, he can see that she is internally debating something. Delson asks what's on her mind, and she very hesitantly brings up that she's been working on a new project. A backup of sorts, in case things got too out of hand, but now might be the best time to use it. And as she's explaining this, the camera pans across a First Sons facility where there are hundreds upon hundreds of test chambers that all begin opening. Suddenly, the perspective jumps back to Cole at the exact same moment that it cut from earlier, but this time, just slightly after where the cut was before, Cole hears a shrill scream. As soon as Cole turns to hear where the scream originated from, he sees a ton of fast, gray, and sharp looking enemies running in a stampede toward everyone. Additionally, behind them is a sea of different colored enemies that all seem to behave just slightly differently from each other. This group of enemies will be called the Conduit Lessers, or Conduit Minions or something along that line, and they will now act as the main enemy type for New Empire City, with Delson's troops being kind of the secondary enemy type. But as a contrast to every single other enemy type in Infamous, this group will not consist of one power with different levels, such as ice or concrete. Each level will be its own power. For instance, the lowest level of enemies will have shrapnel power, those were the gray and sharp ones I described, and they would be the fast exploding type of enemies, and they would be on like the lowest tier. Your most basic one, which would just be like the soldier type enemy that would be pretty common, could be water, or it could be something like fire. And then there could be one that reflects abilities and that would be mirror or something that explodes and goes up in the air which would be like firework or something. But you get the idea. There are dozens and dozens of enemy types, a ton of them that I haven't even thought of yet that a bunch of you can maybe think of and the only criteria would be each of them would have to fulfill a different purpose within gameplay and they could combine and make some interesting gameplay moments that I think Sucker Punch would have a lot of fun designing. As Cole and his allies began to fight the conduits, it soon became clear that they were completely outnumbered and they were all forced to fall back with the wall still standing. Back at base camp, Cole, Riley, Jimmy, and number two all sat in silence as the feeling of failure filled the room. After a few what felt like very long minutes, Jimmy's face suddenly lit up and he noted very excitedly that the math had never lined up for him, but finally it clicked. His men were not being taken to become Celia's ninjas, but to become these conduits. Suddenly, Riley chimed in, saying that that's also probably why she was taking people off the streets. They didn't need to be highly trained because they weren't becoming ninjas. They were becoming mindless conduits. Cole sits and thinks for a moment before finally he has an epiphany and connects the dots between this and what Celia did in New Marais. Looking back, it's extremely obvious to Cole that Celia was the one who took that first son's research, and this puts their conversation on the path of what else she must have found in that room before number two butts in, saying that whatever they're building, that's probably what they stole the manufacturing plants in the Warren for. After everyone gets done with their realizations, they have to get to discussing how to take down the wall once more, but it's clear that they can't do the same plan that they did before. This is because the army that Celia released caused a ton of casualties as well as spread throughout the city like wildfire, causing both the scavengers and the mob's troops to be spread thin, trying to solve all the problems. With the proposition of a new plan on the table, everyone turned to Riley expecting him to solve something, but he just seemed defeated. He put everything he had into the old plan, but ultimately it failed. It was all for nothing, and unless someone has a secret nuke in their back pocket, he's not going to be able to do anything. Right after Riley says nuke, number two's eyes light up, and she says that she has a bad idea. It's a risky plan, and maybe outright suicidal, but if they're willing to hear her out, she can explain her thought process. Everyone silently nods, and she explains that over the past four years or so, the council has been keeping a very close eye on the prison in the Warren district. She says that ever since Delson took over, there's only ever been one prisoner taken into it, and they've never seen any more enter. 
Everyone on the council suspects that it must be some sort of extremely dangerous conduit that Delson, for some weird reason, wants to keep very close, even though it's very dangerous. And if they could somehow find out what's inside the prison and control it, they could use it to take down the wall. But there is one major problem. Because the prison sits inside the Warren district, and the council is very protective over the Warren, they're definitely not going to allow anyone to go inside the prison, or let alone take the conduit out. Cole immediately steps in saying that right now is not a time to ask for permission, and number two agrees. Against her own morals, she tells them to ignore what the council says, and do what's needed to stop Delson for the greater good of humanity. Additionally, now that she's mostly with them now, she revealed a couple things. First, her name was Mala Singh. She was a 28-year-old second-generation Indian immigrant who just happened to move to the city at a bad time, but decided to stay to make things better. After she revealed this, everyone welcomed her to the group before they all got to work with their new plan to break into the prison in order to take down the wall. After just a bit of preparation, Cole traveled to the prison alone, where he fought many high-level concrete soldiers, and as he moved deeper into the prison, he fought more difficult enemies, until eventually he arrived at the final door in the deepest room, labeled Maximum Security, Do Not Enter, Under Any Circumstance. Cole slowly began to enter the room, only to see that it was completely pitch black, except for one single monitor that sat in the center of the room. As he slowly began to walk towards the monitor, as soon as he was just a few feet away, he saw the screen began to glitch, and suddenly, he was sucked inside the display. In one single instant, Cole went from being in a pitch black room, to finding himself inside of a hellish land full of lava, volcanoes, and a bunch of demonic themes. As he began to look around, he saw that there was nothing in sight except for a single path up a mountain to a medieval castle that sat below a swirling vortex of dark clouds. With seemingly nothing else to do, Cole began the climb up to the castle before a booming voice asked who he was and why he was there. Cole responded by saying that he just wanted to talk and he was there to free whoever was being held inside the prison. The voice responded to this with booming laughter and said that this was not a prison, but an evil lair that only brought doom onto others that entered it. Cole eventually reached the apex of the mountain, where he fought dozens of demonic creatures, before eventually reaching the center of the castle, where Cole saw a giant being materialize before him. Cole asked for the being's name, and in a booming voice, it responded, He who dwells. The being then attacked Cole, and the boss fight began, and throughout this fight, Cole tried to explain why he was here, but he who dwells was seemingly in his own mental reality, and thought of this whole thing as some sort of game. But eventually, after Cole defeats him, he says that this is not a game, and that he is close to ending Delson's reign, and he needs his help if he wants to defeat him. Suddenly, the being dematerializes, and shrinks to a normal human form. This is when Cole asks for his actual name, and the man says that his real name is Eugene. During the events of Second Son, Eugene became a total dick. At first, he vowed only to punish the bullies, but then, shortly after Second Son, he realized that he and Delson were becoming the bullies. This was completely cemented in his mind when Seattle was nuked by the government, and Eugene wanted to do nothing with Delson's influence. Of course, Delson couldn't let someone as powerful as Eugene get away, so he trapped him inside this prison, until he eventually would change his mind. Of course, Cole does ask what the whole demonic thing was about, and Eugene simply responds with something that everyone would understand. He just says that his character was going through a villain arc at the time, which is such a Eugene answer, I, I don't know how I came up with it. On the way out of the prison, Cole revealed their plan to use Eugene to take down the wall, and he said that he would do anything to help out, especially after learning what Delson did to Fetch. Eventually, when they both got to safety, everyone in the group got some sleep, and in the morning, they all met up to discuss taking down the wall with Eugene's help. Eugene explains that he is confident in his abilities, and says that Delson made a huge mistake by trapping him for so long. See, these past few years, he's had nothing but time to practice, and he was sure he could take down the wall, as well as decimate Delson's forces, and in return, he only wanted one. Thing. Everyone immediately got ready, and three hours later, they were all prepared. And in that time span, they had deliberately spread word that the raid would happen at a certain time, so Delson's forces would know, and they would all group up. 
But when the time came, instead of seeing hundreds upon hundreds of soldiers line the wall with RPGs, all they saw was one man transform into a giant angel and call himself He Who Dwells. Afterwards, he created hundreds of video angels, a huge portion of which began to dive bomb the wall while Eugene used his massive sword to cause catastrophic damage. After only about a minute or so, there was a huge gap in the wall that was large enough for Eugene to fit through, and once inside, some of his angels began taking down Delson's soldiers, while the rest focused on the wall. This went on for a few minutes, until Delson finally showed his face, and from the looks of it, he was absolutely furious, because he now knew that nothing stood between him and Cole. As Eugene noticed this, he let out a booming laugh, because he finally saw Delson face the failure he so desperately deserved. But Delson didn't think it was funny one bit, and they both began to fight. Even though Eugene is very powerful, and he was in his He Who Dwells form, he still showed great struggle during the fight, but he was able to cause a bunch of damage to Delson, as well as tire him out. But Delson eventually got the last laugh, and as He Who Dwells turned back into Eugene, he stabbed him through the heart using his video claws. As Eugene's very crippled body fell onto one of Delson's concrete structures, Delson noted that he didn't want to kill him completely. He wanted him to suffer for all that he just did. As Delson looked at Eugene's half-dead pathetic body, he asked him if this was all worth it. To which Eugene responded, That wasn't the part that will make this all worth it. I still have one last wish. Suddenly, he waved his hand, and Cole, who was cloaked in invisibility this whole time, appeared right in front of Delson and grabbed his hand. This caused massive sparks of lightning to arc everywhere, and they both screamed in pain until Cole was knocked away by Celia once again. Delson got up from the ground and immediately tried to blast Cole with the video, but he no longer could. This caused Eugene to smile ear to ear, and Cole began to stand up to fight Delson. Celia watched as Cole stood up, and she left the scene just as fast as she arrived. At first, Delson thought that she was abandoning him, but then, his focus fixated on a giant black cloud that began to form in the sky. Cole watched as this was happening as well, but before he could even realize what was happening, a raindrop fell on his face. Delson cracked a smile as it began to rain harder and harder, and he realized that this must have been caused by Celia somehow. The now decently heavy rain put Cole in extreme pain, but Delson prolonged it by trapping his feet in concrete so he couldn't get away. Eugene watched as this was happening and yelled at Delson to stop, but Delson silenced Eugene by forcing concrete daggers into his arms and legs, and continued to revel in both his and Cole's pain. At this moment, when it seemed like there was absolutely no hope for anyone, someone unexpected came to save the day. Riley jumped down from a concrete structure above them and knocked Delson meters away. He quickly created a ceiling above Cole to shield him from more rain before Delson stood up. With a very egotistical tone, Delson asked Riley if he knew who he was, to which Riley said that he knew more than Delson could ever imagine, as he held his hand out, asking for Delson to take it. Of course, Delson hesitated for a second, but then, he grabbed Riley's hand and learned that the unbreakable crystal man was Riley Fox, a member of the Akomish tribe. Upon learning this, Delson stumbled back in a look of both surprise and terror as he was forced to relive the memory of the Akomish from someone else's perspective. Riley saw this happening and continued to berate Delson about the absolute horrors that he had brought upon this world and that the only way to right them was to end him. Riley began to rush towards Delson, but in his haste of emotion, he made one crucial error. Once Riley was only a few feet away, Delson stabbed him with the very crystal that he was made of, because now he had Riley's power. Cole watched as all this was happening, and his lightning began sparking wildly out of anger, but he knew that if he stepped one foot outside of the ceiling that Riley had made for him, then he would most likely die before he could kill Delson. Eugene also watched as all this unfolded, and he knew that a wound like that, conduit or not, meant that there was no hope for saving Riley, and in his final act of life, Eugene began to send a hellstorm of angels down to them that would buy Cole enough time when it shortly arrived. As Riley's critically wounded body laid on the floor, near the edge of the platform they were all on, Delson thanked him for his power, 
and the opportunity to finally end the Akomish. This line was shortly followed by Eugene's Hellstorm that completely demolished the whole area as well as blew Cole out of the way and knocked him out. When Cole eventually woke up, he found that he was back in the heights with Jimmy and his men. He first asked how he got there, and Jimmy explained that one of Eugene's angels carried him here before it disappeared. Cole then told Jimmy about what happened to Riley, but to his surprise, Jimmy said that he knew. Before Riley left to help Cole, Jimmy told him that it was suicide, but Riley said he didn't care. If he sat there and allowed Delson to kill Cole, then there was no hope for anyone. Jimmy slightly grinned after saying that Riley was just that type of guy. He would gladly make the sacrifice play so they could win in the long run. He even thought far enough ahead to call someone to take his responsibility. Cole began to question who could possibly fill shoes that big as Zeke walked into the room. As soon as Cole saw Zeke, he was hit with a mix of emotions, but the ones that stood out were surprise and anger. He was surprised that Zeke was here, but angry that he put himself in this much danger. As Zeke and Cole continued to talk, Zeke assured Cole that he was not being irrational. He would just be their planning guy who would make cool shit and stay on the sidelines. No undercover operations and no climbing giant towers. Speaking of giant towers, Jimmy interjected, there was a problem with getting into Delson's now. The rain cloud that had formed during Cole's encounter with Delson had not moved or shown signs of stopping anytime soon. Cole then reveals Celia's absence during the formation of the cloud, and they all come to the obvious conclusion that this must be some sort of device that she whipped up using First Sun's technology, and their first step should be to disable it. Cole then mentions the unnamed First Sun's facility that they found earlier, and decides to first check there, because that might be where they're hiding all the missing items from the other facilities, or it might just reveal a way to disable it. Before that though, let's talk about the Row District. And just like the other districts, it's now powered off and Cole has to turn it on just like usual, but that's not what I mean. This district looks completely different from the rest as Delson's fingerprints are all over it. It's absolutely covered in concrete structures and those can kind of serve as basically just a playground for developers to do whatever they like with map design. Additionally, the concrete and buildings are covered in graffiti, video, neon, gold, wire, glass, mirror, basically any other power that Delson might be able to use as a creative tool because you gotta remember he's an artist. Also, the eastern side of the island is expanded as there are destroyed military ships like aircraft carriers and destroyers that got punctured by concrete when they got too close to shore. Delson had purposefully left them there as a message to anyone that invasion wasn't an option. If the government wanted their seat of power back, they could not do so by force like they were used to. But gameplay wise, this area would basically be here just to make an expansion to the island that's not artificial. It wouldn't just be an expansion to the actual island and making it bigger. It could be concrete platforms making it bigger or it could be the ships that are making it bigger and it would just make it on par with the rest of the islands and slightly expand the scope of the city. The next mission after turning on the power has Cole going to the unnamed First Sons facility that sits in the northern half of the Row District. After traversing the sewers, Cole finally finds the entrance of the facility where he also finds that there are signs of people who have tried to break in, but it looks like nobody was successful. The signs of break-ins consist of people trying to use blow torches, sledgehammers, and crowbars that are all either dented, bent, or broken. It's also clear from the scorch marks on the door that people tried this for a long time, and as Cole wonders how he will get in, an artificial voice blurts out, DNA signature match, please finish the passphrase, half as long. This voice startles Cole, and he almost destroys the small speaker above the door, which is where the voice is originating from, but he doesn't because he realizes that it's not human. After a moment, he asks the computer to repeat what it said, and it does so. Complete the passphrase, half as long. After Cole hears this, he semi-confidently says, twice as bright, and the door opens as the computer says, welcome back, Kessler. By the looks of it, the lab has remained completely untouched since Kessler was last here, and as Cole looks around, he sees a board with a picture of himself in the middle, and around him are pictures of Zeke, Trish, his parents, Moya, and John. There's also another board that outlines the timeline of events from first Kessler's timeline, where he had married Trish, and then Cole's timeline, ending on Kessler's death, which he knew was going to happen. 
As Cole continues to look around the room, he finds an entire wall that is completely dedicated to glass cases that inside display Kessler's outfits. The player would recognize that all the way on the left is the outfit that Kessler arrived to this timeline with, and as it goes right, it progressively gets more futuristic, with the last one being an empty mannequin, presumably the outfit that Kessler died in. But those are all things that the player and Cole might find interesting. The main thing in this lab, and the thing that Cole really is here for, is the touchscreen computer, basically just a giant tablet, that sat in the middle of the furthest room from the entrance. After unlocking the computer, Cole saw that there were many different folders, with each of them having a different label, but the one that initially caught his eye was titled Surveillance. Cole taps on it, and he's allowed to choose between many different First Sons locations, but he first taps on Pier 12, the location that used to serve as the First Sons main base. This is where he finds that the final footage that was captured from it was when he and Warden Harms raided it and destroyed it for good back in the infamous comics. Cole then hits the back button and clicks on the development facility where he sees the final moments of its footage were cut due to an explosion from the beast. Afterwards, he moves to the research lab and finds that the footage still says that it's alive, and he can still see the ransacked room laying still. After Cole notices this, he decides to go back in the footage to find when it was ransacked, and luckily, the motion sensors had marked it as a time of interest. After Cole tapped on the beginning of the time of interest, he saw the door be completely knocked open by some sort of explosive, and three origami ninjas walked into the perfectly arranged room, before they were followed by Celia. As he continued to watch, he observed her walk around the facility, completely stunned by all the different technology, before ordering her subordinates to collect as much relevant research as possible. Every single person in the room looked around for a minute, until one of the ninjas pointed out an interesting find on a blueprint, but unfortunately, the camera can't see it. She also finds the map to the other facilities, but as Cole continues to watch, he decides that that's the final thing of importance for this base, and he moves on to watch the test lab footage. After Cole clicks on this folder, he sees the live footage of hundreds and hundreds of test chambers that have all been opened. As Cole continues to scroll back, he sees just a different perspective of the exact same cutscene that we saw earlier when he was first raiding the wall, when we saw all the conduit enemies get released from their test chambers and from this facility. But Cole doesn't stop there, as the further and further he goes back, he can see more and more people being dragged in, as well as more prime gondoids being dragged in to infuse the civilians with powers so she can build her army. Eventually, after deciding that he just couldn't watch anymore, Cole moved on to the race sphere containment footage to see Celia and her men ransacking the base for parts. As they do this, Celia is heard saying things like, take anything they use to build it, and if this is going to work, we need to know everything they did. And hearing this made Cole extremely worried, and he quickly went back to the computer's home screen before finding the research and development folder that held all the First Sons projects. After Cole entered this screen, he saw dozens of other folders ranging from 1 to 9 and A to Z, but as he found one folder in particular, the R folder, he saw a project titled Raysphere Mark II. After Cole thoroughly read the project for a while, he found that this race sphere differed from the last one in three major ways. Firstly, it wasn't handheld anymore, as its plans state that it's a 9x9 foot sphere meant to be powered by something with more energy than anything the First Sons could have produced. Secondly, it doesn't just draw energy from non-conduits. It draws energy from everyone in a few mile radius and funnels it to the ones that are closest, giving them a ton of power. And finally, the biggest improvement is it doesn't explode afterwards. This device is so energy efficient that it can store energy inside of it, and over a short time, it grants it to the nearest conduits. So this whole time, Delson wasn't trying to hide from Cole like he thought. He was just buying time to build this device to enhance him and Celia. He also realized that Mala was right. This was the reason that they were stealing the manufacturing facilities from the Warren. They were using it to build the pieces that they needed for the Race Sphere Mark II. Cole knew that he couldn't let this device be activated, and he quickly went to the W section to find people who have subscribed to this channel to find the plans to the weather manipulation device, which he assumed was causing the rain. 
He took a picture of both the plans for the weather manipulation device as well as the race fear mark 2 before beginning to log off the computer but as he was just about to a folder caught his eye the folder was labeled audio logs and cole took a hesitant look at it before tapping on it and seeing hundreds of files dating back years and years before deciding to click the longest one which was also the last one Cole begins to listen as Kessler starts his long speech about how this is his last day on Earth and how his plan worked exactly as intended. As Cole listens further, Kessler begins to get more and more emotional, talking about how he can't imagine what Cole has gone through and what he has put him through. He continues explaining that while he may have chosen to do all this stuff, Cole didn't. This was completely forced upon him and he would have to live the rest of his life thinking that eternal suffering was all his life would amount to. He ends his speech by telling Cole directly that he deserves more than that, and wishes that after the beast is destroyed, he gets to live his happy ending because he sure as hell deserves it. Cole is left absolutely dumbfounded as he turns off the computer and slowly backs away from it. On his way out of the facility, Cole passes by Kessler's outfits and stares at the many he must have worn throughout the decades, but the one just to the left of his main one, where there now stood an empty mannequin, stood out. Cole opened the glass case and took it off the mannequin body, throwing it in a duffel bag that he took with him as he walked out of the base. While Cole hated Kessler to his very core, he could now truly admit that what he did was needed for the world, and it did work. Kessler may have been a monster, but he was a monster who created a hero, one that saved the world once before, and one that would do it again. Cole walked into a room that held Zeke, Jimmy, and Mala. He had called them all in to discuss his recent findings, and after hearing about the Race Fear Mark II, they were all on edge. If Delson and Celia had this device, then they could take over the world in a heartbeat, and Zeke immediately got to work looking at the plans for the weather manipulation device to try to find some sort of weakness. Almost immediately, he saw on the plans that there was actually three of these devices that were needed to make something as big as the rainstorm that's near the needle. Additionally, destroying it wouldn't be very difficult. All Cole would have to do is basically just hit it with a lightning storm. But then, as he said that, he had an idea. What if, instead of destroying these devices, they used them to their advantage? He saw on the plans that there were dozens of modes and types of weather that they could switch to, and if all of them were able to be switched to a lightning storm, then Cole could raid the needle with no problem, using the storm from above to basically give him endless energy. This became the new plan, with each person coming up with some sort of ideas for how they could help out. Eventually, when the meeting was over, Cole took Zeke to the side and took out the duffel bag. He opened it, and Zeke's eyes widened. Cole mentioned that this suit contained technology that was far beyond anything Zeke had worked with, and asked if he could turn it into something useful. Zeke says that he sure can, and Cole thanks him before going to get some sleep. When he wakes up, the main plan to find and change the weather devices has been finished, but there's one slight problem. In order to protect these devices long enough for Cole to get into Delson's needle, they would need far more people to protect them. Eventually, Mala gives Cole an idea, and they begin a mission where they climb and liberate a news building, before at the main newsroom, they turn on the cameras and begin a broadcast to the city. In the broadcast to the city, Cole tells everyone that Delson has a device that will kill everyone and additionally make him basically limitlessly powerful if they can't all band together to stop him. He tells everyone to get any weapon that they can and come at a certain time to a certain location where they need to raid Delson's men, using everything they have to weaken his forces. He ends his message by saying that the ones who fight Delson will forever be remembered as the ones who stood up to the mad tyrant Delson Rowe. Cole waits on a rooftop as the time to capture the weather devices gets closer and closer, and he begins to wonder if anyone will actually show up to help. Suddenly, Zeke walks up behind him holding a duffel bag, asking what he thinks of the situation, and Cole says that he's worried that nobody's going to help the demon of Empire City. Zeke sighs and then begins to tell him the story of how New Murray felt after he died, and assures him that he is a beacon of hope and people will show up. Besides, what do they have to lose? They're gonna die anyways if they don't. Suddenly, Zeke has a face like he just remembered something and tells Cole that he has a surprise for him, and Cole watches as Zeke reaches into a duffel bag and pulls out an odd, slim and sleek wristband slash gauntlet looking item and holds it out in front of him. 
After grabbing it, Cole asks what it is, and Zeke says that it's a paperweight without the next part. He then asks for Cole's amp, and when he has it in hand, he pulls out three weird 3-inch ring-looking devices from his duffel bag. He then attaches each of the rings to each prong of the amp, as well as the base of the handle, and tells Cole to put on the gauntlet. Cole does so, and while Zeke is still holding the amp a few feet away, he tells Cole to send a small current through it. When Cole does this, a lightning tether shoots out to grab the amp and reposition it perfectly into his hand. Zeke then tells him that this can work at any distance as long as he can see the amp, and the circular pieces even work as trackers so he can locate it if it becomes lost. He tells Cole to test it out fully, and Cole does so by hurling it like a javelin super far away before drawing it back to him. And right now, just as a side note, if you're like, what, what is this? Like, uh, again, with the like throwing and bringing it back, that's in like a ton of video games now. This doesn't have to be the idea. I'll talk about that more at the end of the video, but this is just an idea, not the idea. As Cole began to thank Zeke for the gift, Zeke interrupts him by saying that it really was no problem. In fact, he had genuine fun working on futuristic tech, and he had always wanted to try to improve the amp, but this way, he got to do both. Cole felt as his phone began to buzz, and after he pulled it out, he read two messages from both Jimmy and Mala. They said that they had gotten into position, and they were ready for the raid to begin. Cole took a deep breath while staring at the city around him, before jumping off the building and going to get into position himself. As he got into position, he saw a massive armed crowd below him and realized that these were all the citizens of New Empire City right on time. As he stared at the crowd below, he cracked a smile, then turned and created a giant lightning storm signaling the beginning of the invasion. Cole watched as every single citizen began making a mad dash towards the island, with all of them somehow willing to give up their lives so easily so he has time to get to the weather devices and stop Delson. As all the chaos began, Cole made his way to the closest weather device near the Warren District, where the scavengers were fighting for control of it. When the area was eventually clear, Cole contacted Zeke and with his help, inputted a code and a timer that changed the type of weather it produced, when the timer hit zero. He then traveled to the one closest to the heights where he assisted the mob with that one, entering the code and timer once more, before finally he made his way to the last one that was defended by both factions as well as civilians. But this time, this one is a little bit different as when they cleared the area and went to change the device, there was no keypad. Instead, there was a hole where the keypad should have been and a bunch of wires, and when Cole notified Zeke of this, Zeke panicked and suddenly went quiet. Cole assumed that he was probably just doing a little bit of research or maybe reading the blueprints to try to find out a solution, until after a few minutes, when Zeke was seen coming out of his truck to try to help them out. Cole begins to scold him, telling him that he wasn't supposed to leave safety, but Zeke says that it's just too complicated of an issue for him to explain to others, and that he needs to do it himself. Eventually, after just a bit of fiddling with the wires of the device, he says that he's solved it, and everyone celebrates for a few seconds, but those are just a few seconds long enough for a concrete soldier who is injured on the ground to get a clear shot at Zeke. As soon as the concrete dagger enters Zeke's back, Cole has just enough time to catch him before he falls onto the ground. Cole instantly screams to ask if there's any medics nearby, and as some rush to him, he stands back to give them space. While he's watching the medics and doctors tend to Zeke's wounds, he can hear the concrete soldier laughing in the distance, and without a second thought, Cole turns to him and hits him with a lightning bolt so hard that it stops his heart instantly. Eventually, an ambulance arrives, and as Zeke is being taken to the hospital, Cole looks towards the massive concrete space needle and swears he can feel Delson reveling in his pain. The mission ends, and Cole immediately makes his way to the next and final mission. Once he finally starts the mission, the sky in front of him shifts from a heavy rainstorm to a completely dry thunderstorm. Cole takes a deep breath as he feels the sudden power rush of this transformation and quickly absorbs the lightning directly from the sky, just like that one mission in Infamous 2. But immediately, Cole could sense that Delson was trying to slow him down by whatever means possible, as right in front of him, a giant concrete monster, nearly twice the size of the ones he fought before, stood in front of him. Even with the storm above and the massive arsenal of powers that Cole had gained throughout the game, this was still a pretty difficult fight, but eventually he destroyed it and moved to start climbing the tower. 
Eventually, after a pretty long climb, Cole reached the top of the tower and entered the main observation room that was essentially just a big circular room with very high ceilings that overlooked the entire city. So basically just your typical boss fight room. Suspended in the center of this room was a 9x9 spherical device that was currently being worked on by some origami ninjas. Cole began to yell at them to stop working on it, but as he raised his sparking hand, Celia put a blade to his throat. She told Cole to stand down and put his hands together, and Cole, wanting to keep his throat intact, did so. Immediately after this, both Cole's hands and feet were completely encased in concrete, and Delson suddenly appeared from behind the race sphere. Delson told Cole that he has to admit that he is a damn powerful conduit. I mean, not even he could stop him now, or at least, not yet. Because in just a few minutes, Celia's ninjas would be done with the final modifications for the race sphere, and then he would be unstoppable. But behind Delson's back, Celia was staring daggers at him, as Delson continued to speak about what he would do once he ruled the world, but after a minute, the ninjas make a signal that the race sphere is ready to activate. At this, Delson completely turns away from both Cole and Celia to ask if they are completely positive that it's ready, and the ninjas nod and gesture as if saying, go ahead, flip the switch. Delson cracks an evil smirk and says, then it's time, and suddenly raises his arm before killing the ninjas by sending concrete daggers directly through their hearts. Afterwards, he quickly pivots and turns to Celia, who is literally about to stab Delson in the back, and he traps her arms together in concrete, as well as brings her toward him. He angrily says that she is stupid if she thought that she could betray him. He continues his fit of rage by explaining that he found out about Celia's plan to betray him as soon as she let that army of conduits free because they weren't meant for Cole. No, that army was meant for him. They were a last resort in case she ever needed to take the mad tyrant Delson Rowe to his grave. But she knew that that alone wasn't enough, so she banked on the idea that she would use his resources to help construct the race sphere, and at the last moment, she would betray him. But everything changed when Cole arrived, and she could no longer guarantee that he wouldn't take Delson down, and along with him, her spa on top. This forced her plan to speed up tenfold, and now, in her haste, she slipped up, and Delson figured out her plan. Finally, Delson asked her how it felt to realize that all she had to do was know her place as second to him, and she would have lived to see the day where a conduit ruled the world. Delson moved Celia back beside Cole and walked over to the lever that activated the race sphere. He pulled it down and snapped it off the device so that his decision could not be reversed. Instantly, the different evenly sized segments on the hull of the device began to slowly separate as a light blue color glowed on the inside. The camera cuts to show the people outside and closest to the needle begin to scream in agony as they slowly begin dying and their energy is transported to the ray sphere that slowly begins to inch up Delson, Cole, and Celia's power. Delson, in his crazed and power hungry state, failed to notice this, but Cole and Celia did as they looked at each other before they were both able to slowly escape their concrete restraints and after they broke free, Delson finally turned to them. Without any prior communication, both Cole and Celia began to fight Delson together, and as this fight goes on, the race sphere slowly gains more energy. This is signified by the inside energy going from light blue to slowly transitioning into an eventual deep purple. This final fight lasts a while, with Delson using various powers that he no longer has to absorb. Now, he can simply switch between them at will. He does exclusively use his concrete in the first phase of the fight, but as the phases go on, he does eventually get into other abstract and weird powers that he doesn't use that often. Stuff like mirror, flare, glass, sand, blood, and eventually Riley's crystal. But it's not just Delson who grows in power, as Cole quickly gets to a point where he doesn't need to absorb electricity anymore, and he also doesn't hover like normal. Instead, the lightning around him arcs, and it keeps him in the air, and he can fly at will kind of like Superman. Celia also grows in power and gets super fast, and when Delson is at his 1 fourth health mark, when he is seemingly overwhelmed, Celia makes one last dash to end him, but unfortunately, this ends in her own death, and Delson throws her body to the side to focus on Cole. In the final moments of the encounter, as Delson is on very low health, 
Cole grows just too powerful for Delson as he was designed to be the most powerful conduit in the world and he knocks him to the ground where he stays for the time being. Cole begins to ask Delson if there's any way to stop the race sphere, but Delson just smiles and says that this city is beyond saving. Cole looks around and in one final last ditch effort to save the city, he drains all the energy from inside the machine. As he continues to drain it, Delson begins to scream out in agony. He wanted that power for himself, and for his showmanship, he needed to force others to watch him succeed, but that was his downfall. He should have just killed Cole and Celia when he had the chance, but now, it's too late. As Cole was near the tail end of draining the massive amounts of energy from the race sphere, his body slowly started to become less human and more and more energy. This all came to a climax when, just for a split second, Cole absorbed so much energy that he tapped into the fourth dimension. For some weird and unexplained reason, for things that not even Kessler or Cole could either understand, they for some reason have a secondary ability where they're able to alter time. Kessler used this to travel back in time, but Cole, now that he's pure energy, can somehow use it to see time differently. He no longer saw as linear, and with a single thought, he was able to travel through all of his lifetime. Again, in the real world, this was only a split second, maybe a billionth of a second, but to Cole, it felt like minutes. And in these minutes, he was able to look through all of the events in his lifetime. His childhood, his parents, college, when he and Trish dated, the blast, new Murray, and as he kept looking more and more, he saw a mysterious woman that he had never seen before. But Cole wasn't just limited to his own life, and he could also perceive other timelines. One where he saw through the eyes of Kessler, using the power to travel back in time. One where John White stopped him from activating the race sphere, and a timeline where he was the beast. But contrary to what you might be imagining, he didn't just see these things like they were on a screen. He sort of experienced them, he remembered them, and understood them. But eventually, when Cole got to his absolute peak, he could even interact with one. As Cole could sense his power fading, he decided to travel to a time that he wasn't able to experience himself, his own death. As he floated above the clouds like a spectator, looking down at his own body on a boat, he saw Zeke looking inside a casket where he laid, and after a moment, he closed it and sealed it, deciding that that would be the last time he saw Cole. As Cole continued to watch this happen, and the boat slowly floated out to sea, he had a weird feeling overwhelm him. A sense of deja vu, but a lot harder to explain. In one word, it was kind of like destiny. Suddenly, he knew what he had to do, and on screen, the player is prompted to hold down on the D-pad. Cole raises his arms, and the camera cuts to the very same shot and angle that the game opened with, when the lightning strikes the boat, and Cole is transported through time. Suddenly, Cole is back in reality. His powers have slowly begun to die down as he stopped the race fear, and now, all that's left is for him to finish what he started. Delson's face was a combination of both amazement and terror as he saw Cole turn to him and stop to decide what to do with him. This is where the player gets a final choice, either kill Delson or spare him. Just to be clear, there's no good or bad ending here, and each decision will basically just be the same general ending, but nonetheless, having a choice here makes the decision a little bit more heavy, and they both fit with the story, so why not? First, let me just briefly explain what it would be when you kill him, as I assume that it would be far less popular, so I'm just going to kind of quickly get it out of the way in just a couple sentences. As Cole stared down at the once powerful Delson Row, he could only see how much pain he had caused and with no words and barely any effort on Cole's part, a blast of lightning shot down from the sky and completely obliterated Delson, leaving Cole's leather jacket as the only thing left standing. Now, that's not the complete ending, as there is a continuation off of that, but where they both pick up the jackets in both of the endings is basically where they continue off of each other, with the major difference being in one, Delson is alive, and in the other, Delson is dead. So now let's continue with the one where Delson is spared. Without saying a single word, Cole floated towards the once powerful tyrant Delson Rowe and simply held his hand out. What do you want? Delson asks. Not much, Delson. I just want to shake your hand. Nothing more, nothing less. And with no other option other than suicide, Delson grabs Cole's hand and begins to scream out in pain as all of his powers are permanently removed. 
Afterwards, Cole took off his jacket from Delson's back, and together, they floated decently far away where Cole arc restrained Delson's arms to a wall before forcing him to watch what came next. Cole turned towards Delson's space needle that also held the ray sphere. This device and its predecessor had caused nothing but pain for him and millions more, but now he was going to end it and the building that it sat in. Cole raised his arms and clenched his fists before quickly dropping them and therefore sending a massive lightning bolt directly towards the center of the needle, reaching all the way to the underground core reactor that powered the ray sphere. The bolt overloaded the reactor, causing a massive blast that completely collapsed the tower and the few blocks around it. Of course, all the people around had died because of the ray sphere, so it didn't cause any extra casualties. And just a minute later, Jimmy showed up and they put Delson in handcuffs. He has a line about how Delson isn't so scary anymore, but Delson refuses to talk to anyone. As Delson is being driven throughout the city, he can only watch as people in the streets celebrate his downfall, and he literally has no power to change it. The final scene shows Cole floating hundreds of feet above the ground as he stares at the city in front of him. At one point in time, all he wanted was to leave the city, but now he would do anything to save it. The screen fades to black and we get a final stylized cutscene that explains the aftermath of the events of the game. Cole narrates and explains that over time he powered down to a reasonable level, enough that he looked normal but he was still incredibly powerful, so powerful that nobody could stop him, but of course he used that for good. First, he cleaned up New Empire City, earning the title the Guardian of New Empire City, which was a nice change of pace. After cleaning up the city, he got the government back up and running, ending the conduit reign while making sure that conduits and humans had equal rights in the newly written constitution since the old one was destroyed when Delson overthrew the government. Speaking of Delson, he would be serving a multiple life sentence inside of a secret prison that was built solely for his detainment that was in the middle of Alaska. He was also given no visitors, daily checks, and zero outside contact in any way. Cole continues by stating that it took years and years for society to get back to any semblance of order, but everyone was contributing, and now, it truly felt like the country was healing. As for his friends, well, he's happy to say that Zeke didn't die, but he did spend a while in a wheelchair before he learned to walk again. Also, his wife had her baby. Cole Jedediah Dunbar is now 3 years old, and they all live happily in New Empire City. Speaking of, with Delson and Celia out of the way, they were able to finally find records that Celia was the culprit behind Maggie Thompson's murder that happened years ago, and Jimmy Valentino was now the proud mayor of New Empire City. His mob was also disbanded, and a lot of them were diluted into the newly formed police force. But Mala may have played the biggest part in everything, as she was Jimmy's city manager, and she played a huge role in rebuilding the historic district, as well as revamping the Warren into an economic titan, while Jimmy mostly dealt with the vast amounts of paperwork. One of Mala's first ever projects was to create a giant statue made entirely of crystal that would honor Riley directly where he died in the center of Fox Park. Below the statue was a giant plaque that commemorated every single person who had died raiding Delson's men at the end of the game. And finally, after two years of Delson's imprisonment, Cole saw a woman who he had never met, but thought looked eerily familiar. Now, just two years after that, they're getting married with Zeke as Cole's best man. Cole always thought that he was the one who would forever be cursed with suffering and hardship that he would be alone with that burden. But seeing those people at New Empire City fight for him, he realized that a burden as heavy as the world needs to be shared by everyone. So nowadays, he takes some days off, mostly spending them with his wife and friends, and it's on those days that he realizes he truly did get the happy ending he deserved. First things first, I wanted to get something out of the way. I know that this video is not perfect, and I know that because I spent a long time making it, so I know that it's not perfect, and I know that a lot of you, or maybe some of you, have already left comments, maybe digging through my plot points, or being like, this character doesn't make sense, or there's no motivation, I know, okay? I had a certain amount of time to work on this video, and at some point, I just had to stop. I could have worked on this video for a whole other year, and it would have been four hours long, and I would have never stopped working on it, but I had to stop at some point. 
That being said though, I do want to revisit this video eventually, not like in the near future, but probably in the further future, maybe in a couple of years, because I really want to get better at storytelling and writing and then come back to this and be able to have something that I can pick apart and reorganize. I very much view this video as a first draft. This is a concept of what could be and not something that I see myself submitting to Sucker Punch and being like, here you go, make it. And hopefully you picked up on that throughout the video that this isn't absolutely perfect. And if you did and you could see some flaws, please point them out in the comments because the next time I rework this video, I wanna be able to scroll through the comments and see people saying, you know, this plot point really doesn't make sense or there's a plot hole here or the character motivation is off. Seriously, just go say whatever you like because I'll take it as constructive criticism and it'll help me a lot in the future and I definitely won't take it as an attack on my character. But with that out of the way, let's talk about the main 15 or 20 bullet points that I had for this last part of the video as they'll consist of just general things as well as powers and some gameplay stuff. So let's get into it. First up, I wanted to talk about how I wanted this game to be more sci-fi. Just like the first two infamous games, I felt like that one of their best attributes was feeling like a comic book or feeling like it was just in some sort of sci-fi universe, but I felt like that that was completely lacking from Second Son. Second Son was mostly about rebooting the infamous series for a wider audience, and that's most likely why it left out all the secret society, giant monster, time travel aspects that I think made the series unique to begin with. So in this game, I added all that stuff back in, and that's through things like the first sun's bases and the more futuristic technology, and of course the whole fourth dimensional thing at the end of the game. I thought that it just adds that more sci-fi comic book feel, which is what I was really going for. Next up, I wanted to talk about how I know that there would need to be more characters to give a little bit more plot lines if it was a full game. And originally when I wrote the script, I did have a few more characters and some other plot lines, but I decided to remove all of them to just streamline the story. Also, I was going to begin the video with a quick description of each character, but I felt like the surprise of not knowing who might return was more important for the story overall than necessarily being over the top accurate. Next up, I want to talk about the whole two maps thing, having New Marais as well as New Empire City in a single game. And this is the one thing that I felt the most iffy about as I was creating the story. I didn't feel that the transition between the two cities was done perfectly, but currently, without completely remaking the whole entire story and the whole entire game, I have no idea how to fix it. If I begin to think like a Sucker Punch developer, or really any developer, my main concern for the Switch in these cities would be all the side missions and collectibles that are left in New Marais. Because my plan currently would be that after you beat the main story, you could go back and finish them, but it would just feel kind of weird. Imagine right before moving on to New Empire City, you start some sort of side quest, and then you have to finish the whole entire game before finishing it. Or imagine you're locked out of some sort of upgrade because back in New Marais, you didn't collect enough blast shards. It's just not a very perfect situation whatsoever, but when I revisit this, I will try to find the best solution. But for now, when Delson is defeated, the game would revert back to before the final mission, but all the lightning clouds around Delson's needle would be gone, and you could go to your map and travel between the cities. Now you have finally made it. Let's begin talking about the powers, and starting off, I'm going to change the controls to be exactly like Second Son, because looking back, the controls for the first two infamous games sucked ass. The main problem was that when you wanted to throw a grenade by using square or shoot a missile with triangle, you had to move your thumb away from the joystick that you aim with. This caused so many issues with aiming, and fixing this is the first major thing that Second Son did absolutely perfectly without a doubt. Now that the controls are changed, I think that the way Cole uses powers needs to change as well. No more are we going to have some sort of quick selection screen like an in Infamous 2. Now we'll have a type of class system that you can quickly switch between. There would be three major classes. The short range and very powerful class that runs out of electricity the quickest. Then there would be the mid range, the versatile and average class that would deplete electricity at a normal pace. And this would be mostly familiar to everyone who's played Infamous as it would be just basically where you're used to. Finally, there would be a long range, slow fire rate and very accurate class that would be the most electrically efficient or whatever. Each class would have different lightning bolts, grenades, rockets and a special ability. And the best way I can describe what I mean by this is by comparing it to other things. In this instance, I want to compare them to, and 
It's, it's kind of a weird comparison, but guns in Call of Duty. So the close range class would be like a shotgun where it's very high damage, very up in your face and low fire rate. Or maybe you could pick an SMG where it's very high fire rate, but still kind of inaccurate and up in your face. The mid range would be like an assault rifle, both burst and auto with each of them giving you different advantages. The burst would probably be higher damage, but the full auto would be kind of just the nicest to have. And finally, obviously, the long range would be like a sniper. It would be very high damage and lower fire rate if it was like a bolt action, or it would be kind of higher fire rate and still high damage if it was a semi-auto. If you're wondering how you would quickly switch between these if you don't have a quick selection menu, it's because I would basically just directly steal the stance system in Sucker Punch's Ghost of Tsushima. I think that this would work absolutely perfectly as it would allow for very on the fly and quick transitions between gameplay styles because, well, just let me set the scene for you. You, the player, or Cole, or however you want to see it, is running off the rooftop of a building. As you jump off of it, you see about four enemies below you. Because you're pretty familiar with each of the classes, you immediately press the button to slow down time and switch to another class which would be your long range. You would then hit them with a grenade that would kind of put them in some sort of stasis, sort of similar to Neon. Then as soon as you land on the ground, you'd shoot the most powerful enemy with a rocket on your mid range class which would explode twice because again, you know that, and with the other three enemies left you'd switch to your close range, throw a grenade which pulls all of them in, and then shooting them with a very powerful shotgun blast that arcs electricity between all of them. And I know that that might not sound like the craziest example, but it's a realistic depiction of what could happen and what would happen if this were to be implemented in an infamous game. Also, I just think it's a general improvement overall, and I think that they tried to do something like this in Second Son where they had different classes because if I think about it, smoke feels like the short range one, and video feels like mid range, and neon feels like long range. But the problem with Second Son is that it just takes too long. You have to literally leave combat. You have to flee the fight to go find a new source of power. Or maybe there's one near you, but it just takes too long and you have to think about it. But you're in the middle of a fight. You're not going to think about it. With this, you can easily do it and it would be a lot more fluid. Also, if you are wondering, the reason I had two options for every single class is because there would be some sort of skill tree thing in a menu where you'd be able to go and select what specifically you like about each class. So for close range, do you like it to be fast or do you like it to be powerful? And that would be kind of for every single class, you'd be able to go and select your preferences. But in general, the reason I think that this would work very well for the Infamous series is because it would cater towards so many different people's play styles. It would also offer so many options that the Infamous series has never seen and be a very fast and fluid system. Now it's finally time to talk about the main powers. These are the things that Cole would get from the core reactors and some of them are new, but some of them are also returning from old games. And while I don't know what order these would be in gameplay or story wise, these are just some random ideas and I'll throw them out there kind of rapid fire. Cole could possibly gain a very overhauled and upgraded lightning tether ability that would also have some offensive and defensive capabilities so it's not just used for traversal. There could be a rechargeable power where Cole creates a temporary storm of lightning above him so the player can get unlimited electricity for a bit. Cole could possibly get some sort of EMP ability that would disable enemy equipment, weapons, and also maybe it disables conduit powers, just something kind of weird and out there but it's an idea. There would be a sort of electrolocation type thing that Cole would have and it would allow him to see through walls and see enemy weak points and this would be pretty good passive ability that he might earn pretty early on. I would like to see Cole's shield return like an infamous one but this time it would be a lot better and it would also be used offensively as well. When Cole eventually figures out that he can take powers away that could possibly become his new bio leech where instead of taking people's lives away he takes their powers away. Cole could be able to magnetically disarm people so that would pull all the nearby enemies weapons towards Cole and he could throw them back at them and they would explode on impact or something. As soon as you're being taught about the class system, so as soon as you're going through the tutorial of that system, one of the branches could be locked off until you eventually unlock them via a core reactor. So basically half of your power set will be completely locked off until the other half is unlocked and it's like a whole new world has opened. As the story gets further and further and Cole gets more and more powerful, he could unlock some of Kessler's abilities, like some sort of short range teleportation or the ability to make electrical clones of himself. Just anything that Kessler might have used during the infamous one boss fight. 
And finally, my last idea is less of an idea as it is a fully fleshed out plan for the static thrust upgrade. But really it's actually more of an overhaul than it is an upgrade because I'm changing quite a bit. First off, unless you're on a very tall building or you're already in the air, static thrust is practically useless. So Cole needs an ability to launch him into the air so he can actually use it. And for me, this would be done by holding X and R2 and Cole would go near the ground, charge his static thrust and launch into the sky. At that point, once you're already in the sky or you're pretty high up, then Cole would just be able to hover like normal. Just like Second Son, he would hold X and he would just hover there without using any electricity. But if you were to hold down R2, then Cole would boost forward towards wherever you point him. This would use electricity, but once you run out, you would revert back to the normal hover until you can absorb some more. Also, having an ability to just hover up, just go vertically would also be useful. So holding R1 would move Cole upward, and this would also consume electricity. But most importantly, it would allow you to spend just less time climbing buildings, because that's a pretty annoying thing to do in Infamous, and this kind of just solves that. That would basically just be what you unlock from the core reactor. But if you were to upgrade it further via like blast shards or something, then it would also add a few more things to this that would make it a lot more useful. Just like the smoke vents in Second Sun, most if not every building in this game would have these metal junction boxes at the bottom that would have a metal pipe running up to the roof where there would be some sort of battery or generator. Cole would basically get the ability to use these just like the vents in Second Sun. He could just use them to travel up the building super fast and also launch him into the air. Additionally, these battery and generator things would also be used to move Cole forward. So as he's boosting and he goes above one, it recharges his electricity, boosts him in the air, and gives him a little bit of a speed boost. So these would be very similar to the vents and the paraglider in Dying Light 2. That's kind of what I compare it to. All of these new things combined with all of the old things like the train tracks and the power lines that already exist within the cities would just all combine to make traversal a whole lot better and I think it would be a whole lot more engaging. While we're speaking about overhauling things in traversal, I'm just going to get out of the way and say that I think it's time we make a simple change to the parkour in these games. I don't think that the player should ever have to spam X to climb and instead Cole should just very smoothly and quickly climb as you hold forward on the joystick. There should also be a lot more animations for jumping between buildings and just parkouring over things and vaulting because I think that these games don't feel like parkour games, they just feel like they have a climbing mechanic. And the last thing I wanted to say before I get to my like final final thoughts is that I think after the game is beat, there's no reason for there not to be some super creative and cool shit that just cosmetically looks pretty awesome. I think that each of Kessler's outfits should be an outfit that you're able to earn, or maybe even an outfit that's styled like Delson, or different skins for the amp. But the main thing that I think should be added is different colored lightning. I would absolutely love if after I beat an infamous game, I could go around the city grabbing collectibles or doing side missions with purple or yellow lightning. I just think that that would be so dope, and even after like 100%ing the game, you could get some sort of secret outfit or rainbow lightning. That's just the kind of stuff that should be unlockable once you no longer have to consider stuff like canon or cutscenes or anything story-wise. But finally, the last thing I want to say about this whole entire video is that if I wasn't to get a game like this, then I probably wouldn't want an infamous sequel at all. Instead, I would much rather a reboot of the series that's developed on modern hardware. I would absolutely love to see what the team at Sucker Punch could do with modern hardware and virtually no limits to their original idea of what Infamous 1 could have been. If they were to reboot, we would get to see a more in-depth story, far better graphics, a massive city completely full of life, very unique abilities, way better traversal, and a fresh start for one of my favorite games of all time.